he's making the movie. He's not making the character. Yeah. He's all about spectacle, which I feel like is what Oppenheimer's going to be like. I'm, yeah, but I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I'll probably see it, though. Like, of course. Because it's, it's Nolan boy. He, he does have a focus when he's making his movies. And characters is not usually one of them. Never. And, yeah, so John, and that was like his breakout role, right, Tenet? Yeah. Well, and, it was, I think he did Black Klansman before that. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Because Tenet was supposed to come out in COVID. Or it did come out in COVID. Yeah. It was like it got pushed back to like kind of mid-COVID or end of COVID. Yeah. Well, Chris Nolan, he tried so hard to keep it. Yeah. On the date that it was supposed to come out, but Warner Brothers was like not having it. No. So then That's what I'm saying. I think it was like a March release. Yeah. And then it got bumped back to July, and then I thought it came out in like September. I don't rem- <clears throat> I, the timeline is fuzzy to me. That yes. whole that whole time period is just a big fucking blur. Right. So But in the in that movie I thought John David Washington was uh like you said, you know a block of wood. Yeah. But um it was because of the character, like that's, and his character made sense for why, like how he acted as that person. In Tenet? Yes. Uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, it was, he's literally named protagonist. Like, yeah. he's not given any that's real a movie personality. That I would much. love to talk about and go over my theory about. Uh, yeah, we'll have to revisit that one day. <laughs> I'd be curious. Because I have, I have thoughts. I've only seen it once. Same I'm curious here. how I'll feel on a rewatch. Because I'm probably I'm understand on it. nothing about it still. Oh yeah, you probably. Because yeah. I'm a big dumb idiot monkey boy. Yeah. Um. So uh, I guess we can get started. Let's do it. I want to try to not repeat myself, but then I seem to do it continuously in my films. It's not something I make any effort to do. I just make it. I just want to make films that are personal but interesting to an audience. I feel I get criticized for style over substance and for details that get in the way of the characters, but every decision I make is how to bring those characters forward. Is is that Christopher Nolan? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really funny if it was. Yeah. <laughs> After we just talked about it. I was going to say, why are you... <laughs> Uh, it's like you need to try a little harder, Chris. <laughs> style over substance, and the characters are all moving towards a point. Who said this? Do do do. Russo brothers. No. Mm, who's that? I'll give you a hint. I try to usually not quote directors back to back if I've already quoted them. Tarantino. No, who was the last one that you quoted? Last one was Tarantino, I think. Okay. I think it was about his foot fetish. Yeah. So, wait, you're telling me that this is not Tarantino. This then. isn't any of the directors I've quoted before. Oh, and we've done the... Oh, because they're, they're kids. Yeah. Uh, Wes Anderson. Hercules. Yes. Hey, how about that? Congrats. Wes Anderson. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I really didn't have much time to look up any like really funny quotes that I thought would be, you know tongue-in-cheek and kind of fun to touch on i just looked up something that i thought was interesting to maybe talk about Mm -hmm. just the idea of wes anderson and how his movies can kind of have a similar tone and characters and style and kind of you know he's i think criticized a bunch for having a repetitive writing style which i tend to agree with in parts but at the same time i don't know if i would classify his movies as style over substance definitely style is like at the forefront of it, but I don't think it's in disservice to the characters or the writing for a good portion of his films, at least. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about it. I would say it's tough. I mean, I don't see, I I do, I do feel like style over substance. I think for sure. I think his stuff is always his set designs, the way that he kind of, um, you know, draw stuff up, what he uses, um, mm-hmm. the props, you know, his kind of way of looking at film and really putting it in almost like a 2D aspect. Not not literally like we did see. Um, but, you know, I think he's got a different lens or view on it, and it's more of what we see than actually what the characters are going through. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to think, like, a lot of his f- – I shouldn't say a lot. His films just coming off in the top of my mind, I really don't feel like there's a whole lot of... His characters feel one-dimensional. Yeah. Well, at least, yeah. For certain films, I do agree with you. I do feel that way. Like, 
Life Aquatic, Royal Tenenbaums, The French Dispatch. Those are the three movies that I think of when I think of repetitive Wes Anderson characters and writing style. And I love the Grand Budapest Hotel. Me too. You That's know, at the top of my list. Yeah, the same. And I, 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 I kind of, I still feel that same way that they fit in the same tone. I feel like the characters in that movie are different enough to sort of justify having the characters being written the way they are, and they're very quirky, like a lot of his movies. They're very sort of quippy, like a lot of his movies. But you've got Ralph Fiennes who plays like the eccentric hotel concierge. You've got Tony. I always want to say Tony Ravioli, but that's not his name. It's Rever Revolori, I think is his name. Oh, he's the bellhop kid. Yes. Uh, he plays sort of like the foil to him, where they're friends, but he's like sort of the meek, quiet assistant who kind of gets into his own later in the film. You've got Adrian Brody, whose character I real I find like really funny. <laughs> he just he just outbursts randomly. And yes. He, he, he's got like a crazy style. You've got Willem Dafoe, who's literally just a bodyguard. Like I think the characters in that in that movie are different enough to where it, it makes me feel like it's more of a well rounded movie. A movie like The French Dispatch, I feel like a majority of those characters they they speak the same. They have a lot of the same cadence. Their personalities aren't too dissimilar from each other. Dry. They're they're very dry. Like he sucks out the emotions of what you're like a human would feel, mm -hmm. and puts you in a vacuum with these situations at hand. Yes, like Jeffrey Rush's <laughs> character in the French Dispatch is very similar to Bill Murray's character in the French Dispatch mm -hmm. to me. Whereas in Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, Ralph Fiennes' character is pretty different from Adrian Brody, who's yes. different from Tony Ravioli. I do say that, but I still think that when you look at the characters individually, they all are one-dimensional still. Like, I don't... There's... I don't know if I'd say all. I, most, for sure. Like, Willem Dafoe's definitely one-dimensional. Adrian Brody is one-dimensional. But I think there's a little bit of nuance there. For the sure, the quirkiness. See, yeah, that's why I guess it's. Yeah, I'm. We're. Yes, because <laughs> I do agree, and I really like the Grand the Grand Budapest. I own it. You know, like, mm. I love. Like I saw it, and I loved it. I still don't think that they're like. There's not a lot of growth with what you're going through. Like he said, it's putting the characters driving to a point. Yeah, as opposed to them actually, uh, having an arc themselves. Mm -hmm. The situations in Wes Anderson's movies is I think what a lot of people enjoy about them, like the, where the characters find themselves. The driving point, yeah. 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 And if you watch his movies enough, you'll notice a pattern that he loves to follow where at the climax of the film, all the characters converge during this big sort of climactic either showdown or chase scene. Like mm -hmm. there's always usually a chase scene in Wes Anderson's movies where the characters are frantically moving around trying to figure something out. They're very quirkily talking amongst themselves like how do they solve this issue and then they just rush around and do whatever it is they need to do or yeah. whatever happens needs to happen like it's very similar to how his movies just all sort of conclude yeah and not that there's anything wrong with it it's just you know different flavors of the same kind of thing from time to time i guess yeah i and that's what <clears throat> i kind of agree with it i mean you know i think it is style over substance and i think i, I would say all of his movies are very well, I don't know. I thought I saw something about symmetry in his films and how he pulls a lot of it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I it's unique enough, but at the same token, I like you're saying, I mean, yeah. it's a lot of the maybe same flavors in a different can. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of movie sets, a lot of movies are set in New York City. Hey, oh, which is where I went for vacation. No, you did not. Oh. Believe me, Milkman. Believe it. I went there. And let me tell you about uh, some of the things that I experienced. Yeah. So I uh, went to the Nintendo store in New York City, which is the only official Nintendo store in all of America. Really? So that was pretty cool. I spent most of my money there. <laughs> um, I went and saw The Whale. Oh, with Brennan Fraser? Mm-hmm. I saw that movie. Where'd you see it at? Uh... I, I don't remember the exact location. It was in an AMC theater. And it was a pretty big theater. It had escalators in it. 
which wow. is how big it was. Like the theater itself, just it wasn't like part of a mall or anything. It sure. was just like by itself. Four on story some building corner. that just has movie theater, uh, movie theater. In yeah, it. yeah. Instead of a big long horizontal building like what we have in West Michigan, just think of it going up. Yep, <laughs> that's, that's all. I'm, there's yeah, eight that's movie, what it is. There's eight theaters in here, and it's four stories. And it's funny because so it was a very New York crowd. It was a lot of like what I assume, like a twenty four hipster kids going to see it. Yeah, you but know. they're too cool for A24. Oh, yeah. But, it, I mean, it's still an A24 movie, so they went and saw it anyway. <laughs> um, Ragged it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I can't wait for you to see it so we can talk about it. Really? I Yeah. Where's it at? It's, so is it so in it's theaters? not out yet nationwide. It's only It was only in select theaters oh. at the time that I saw it. So I think it was only playing in like major cities like New York, probably Los Angeles, mm -hmm. whatever. Like it was very limited release. So I saw that it was out and I was like, we need to go see this. And we squeezed it into our schedule and we saw it. And I will just say at the end of the movie, Megan was crying a lot. Wow. Yeah. No, like she looked at me after the movie was done and said, why did you do this to me? <laughs> like, oh, man. Ugly crying. It was... I heard her sniffle quite a bit during the whole runtime. So not ugly crying, just kind of, just kind of like gently weeping. My throat feels really tight, and I can't hold this in, but I don't feel like going. Bah! Yeah, you know that's ugly. Ugly crying is when the dams break. Yeah, ugly crying is when you just. Bah! You yeah, know? there was none of that, but it was a gently lot of gently weeping. It was that a lot could of, be done. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that going on, but not no blinking. Yeah, excellent movie. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. Um, if Brendan Fraser and Sadie Sink don't get nominated for Oscars, there's something wrong with the Academy. Like, they will. Are you kidding me? Brendan Fraser's on. He's already on his Academy tour. That started a month ago before the movie even I, got released. I don't doubt that A24 would put all their eggs in that basket to to campaign for that movie, yeah. The Whale. Like they'd be idiots not to. Honestly. Like find people, out how hipster they are. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if, too, they were too cool for the Academy. Yeah. Well, they've tried to like, so they've done both strategies in that they've tried to sort of blanket the movies that came out in a certain year for the Academy. Mm -hmm. And that didn't work because they didn't focus on one specific movie. And so then one year they focused it all on Lady Bird. And then I think there was another, I think it might have been Moonlight that got a lot of the attention for A24 instead of Lady Bird. Right. Like they put all their eggs in one basket. It was just the wrong basket. So well, it still ended up working out, didn't it? I mean, it worked out, yeah. <laughs> but if they do it for the whale, then they'll they'll for sure have it, I think. They should anyway. Interesting. Yeah. So the whale was great. We went on this um we went on this self guided film tour, which is where we walked around different locations in New York that were featured in movies. Yeah. And whoever wrote the self guided tour on the website we were using fucking loves when harry met sally oh because that movie was mentioned in almost every single location we went to so we went to the pond where they filmed Stuart little the scene where they get yeah. in the like boat remote control thing yeah the uh we saw that it didn't have any water in it um there was a the, wait the pond den or the boat den the <laughs> the pond den really yeah it was what's just, it called when it's waterless um just a piece trough, of shit. Just a big trough. <laughs> yeah. A trough where you can probably dirt bike in. Although I'd be surprised if I saw any in New York. Um, we saw the... There was a statue of Alice in Wonderland. That was pretty cool. Although it was like more based off like the books than the movies. Because the characters were more like disproportionately sized, I guess. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you're on LSD and you're right. Pretty much, yeah. Um, we saw... This was my favorite part. We saw the fountain... And the sort of like park Hugh stairway. Jackman? No, uh, it was the fountain that was featured at the end of John Wick Chapter Two. I don't know if you remember that scene. He like goes up to Winston and that whole thing. Sure, yeah. Okay, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> it was in John Wick Two, and uh, I was very happy about that. I was very psyched. Oh yeah. There was like a band shell that I guess was featured in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Cool. Um, and then the Plaza Hotel, which was featured in Home Alone 2. Mm, Lost saw that. in New York. Yep. Uh, so that was pretty much all that I can remember for that. And then 
yeah as far as like movie stuff goes that was that was my my exciting new york experience that's so. pretty sick though i mean that's like what two hours of walking around mm-hmm. oh i almost forgot so uh i guess so we stayed with megan's friend and her her friend's boyfriend's brother interned at a24 and i learned a little bit about like the process of how they choose their scripts for what movies they want to go with and <laughs> and create it's super baked and go off their mood uh (laughs) maybe a little bit um but i guess the process of it is they go through like 20 something scripts per week and they have to pick out which ones they think would make the best ones to make and so they hand it to whoever is actually in charge of making that decision and he told me that a lot of the times the scripts that they would pick they would hand them over to whoever makes those decisions and they would usually not choose them, not because they were bad movies because they were usually like really well written, really like well thought out and well put scripts. Right. But because they either did or didn't have a certain political angle to them that Hollywood needs in order to get a movie like that made. So Mm -hmm. it was a really interesting kind of process to learn about, I guess, like secondhand from him, like his brother's experience. So you're saying political angle, not necessarily like the Dems and the Republicans, but more. Not necessarily, just like whatever, whatever topic, I guess, was being touched on in that movie. Right. Having them. How characters (laughs) were portrayed, I guess, like just, you know, whatever was featured in that script to prevent it from being made. Like they were, they would be like amazing scripts. I guess he would tell me, but yeah, they just wouldn't be picked because of like some kind of political, the tone detail in the film. Oh really? Yeah. What that means exactly. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. That's just what he told me, but it's okay. fascinating. Sure. Even a 24 people that work there are cryptic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause even though like a 24 is a brand that like likes to pride itself on being really, Wow. indie and out there and yeah. different from a lot of the mainstream movies i guess they still have a sort of range that they need to appeal to in order to get their films See, yeah you say that I mean, I, I'm, what was the movie about the birthing of the sheep lamb yeah <laughs> is that like a religious overtone like when you talk could be i haven't <laughs> I, I thought about that movie recently i i want to watch it i want to check it out it's it's been out for like a while yeah i got a lot of reviews yeah uh I know nothing about like how it was received or like what people think of it. I just, I just want to check it out. Mm-hmm. I don't want any like external influence to right seep into my to my hippocampus before I experience it. Nice. So, eventually I'll do that. But yeah, that was my my New York happenings. So he was an intern there. What's he do now? I don't know what he does now. Um, he might have told me, but I don't remember. I know he told me that he went to film school. Cool. Like out in California, I think. So sounds like he had a lot of experience and was well, kind of entrenched in that yeah, world. It's an internship. Mm-hmm. You get, get to see. Maybe it will help him out if he's a screenwriter. Yeah. And it's A24 is, I'm pretty sure, based in New York. Because the shirt that I have says A24, New based York. Based in New York. New York oh. City, New York. <laughs> 2012 LLC or like whatever it says. I don't know. I'd be wearing it right now, but it's. I think it's in the wash. Mm, got in, it yeah. in the wash so uh yeah we got some uh speaking of wash i got some movie news to cover first before we get oh into discussion God. yeah let's go this we is, got a packed episode this is juice there's a lot happening so probably good movies three films that we have to talk about then because i mean they're all yeah yeah you know what i'm saying it's i not, know what you're there's saying not a, yeah yeah <laughs> it's not like stalker <laughs> yes that is a great call yeah um and we didn't get a whole lot of questions we got one on youtube uh oh. so we'll touch on that before we wrap up but i figured we'd talk about these because i think they're interesting okay uh henry cavill i don't know if you've been reading anything about what's I going on I with s- him i did not well i do know what happened but i don't know why it happened so dc just really does great jobs at making decisions i know right especially this past year so henry cavill was part of the witcher that was on netflix and uh, he left The Witcher in part because he didn't like that they weren't following the source material of the books, but also in part because Warner Brothers came to him and said, hey, do you want to come back and be Superman again? And Henry Cavill said, yes, I would love to. 
please let me be Superman. I love the character so much. And so he left The Witcher. And a month later, James Gunn pretty much became the Kevin Feige of DC, essentially. And James Gunn came out and said, hey, we're restarting the Snyderverse, baby. We're restarting the DCU. Oh, by the way, Henry Cavill's not coming back. And then Henry Cavill on Instagram said, yeah, this isn't exactly the news I wanted to hear, but I mean, shit, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's essentially what he said. Right. And so Henry Cavill just can't catch a break. Like, he left this show partially so he could do Superman, and then he can't even be Superman. <laughs> it was It's <laughs> bizarre to me. <laughs> it's fucked up. Like, they kind of fucked him over a little. I I don't know what DC's doing, and I think that they're just trying to do, like, a complete... They're just trying to fucking s- start from scratch. That's what I'm saying. Like, and like maybe they don't want any ties to Zack Snyder. God, Zack Snyder is... <laughs> I don't think I don't think they want I don't think they want to associate themselves with the mess that was like the DCEU because they changed it to the DCU to separate it from the DCEU entertainment universe extended universe which is what I guess it was but okay. not that it not that it matters too much but okay so do you have more DC news because I mean there was other news that came out that I really didn't dive in on but uh, what do you got the rock uh, black Adam yeah what about he unfollowed Warner Bros and uh, uh, Black Adam or he unfollowed Warner Bros and DCU on Instagram? It might be because they're probably not going to go with whatever storylines they want to do with that character. That's what I'm saying. Like, because I guess spoiler for Black Adam, in uh-oh. case you care, I guess Henry Cavill as Superman shows up as a cameo in Black Adam. So. <laughs> They, they have him come in as a cameo. The Rock is going on about how he wants to see his character as Black Adam fight Henry Cavill as Superman in the DCEU. Right. And all of a sudden, Henry Cavill's not in the DCEU anymore or whatever. Cause it, they must have had that conversation with Dwayne Johnson. Like, hey, man, thanks for the one and done. <laughs> right. And I'm assuming that it's also in part because Black Adam didn't do as well as they wanted it to. Dude, it's already at HBO Max. Is it really? Yeah. I was wondering when they were going to drop it. I feel like it's been a while because they... They thought they probably thought it was going to do really well in theaters, so they held off, like hoping it was a Marvel. It was in theaters for like two and a half months. Or was like it three really? months or something. Like, I feel like it was in theaters for like such a long time. That's so bizarre because I feel like it was in f- theaters for like three weeks. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know when it got released. I remember seeing how much stuff was on it, but like when we went to a when we went and saw what movie did we go out and see? It um, was me and Jay Hall, good friend, friend of the pod, Jay Hall. But they had like a, they had a uh, trailer for Black Adam, mm. and like that was like in October. Yeah. Like so, I don't know. I could be way off, but I, I feel I, like it was only out. But that's my memory is also really bad. I don't know. I, I maybe it, to me it just feels longer. Yeah. Because I was kind of waiting for it to go on HBO Max because I thought about maybe seeing it, but I wasn't going to pay to see it. Like, I'm not interested in, in giving them any money. So, so they're doing they're doing like a complete revamp. Yeah. James Gunn's like, we got to disassociate everything that was ever associated with it. James and- Gunn came in and said, we need to just start from the ground up. I don't know if he's gonna keep any of his Suicide Squad stuff because he directed that newer movie, and he's I bet also you he will because that that was one of the ones that kind of I mean they were trying to separate. Yeah, like he kind of started from scratch there anyway. Like he he brought in new characters and new actors. Like he replaced Will Smith essentially. So I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't be surprised if he kept those characters that he created for that movie, but. I'm yeah I'm assuming that that The Rock is just pissed off because. It, the Black Adam didn't do nearly as well as he wanted it to. I mean, I think it has like, it had like a budget of like 150 million, I think, and it made like 300 million or something at the box office, which for a superhero big budget movie is not what they wanted to see at right. all. Right. <laughs> right. Like, I'm pretty sure the Ant Man sequel made more than fucking Black Adam. <laughs> People are paying more money for the Ant Man trailer right now than they did Black Adam. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're probably seeing it more honestly in the oh movies that God. they go see. They played it for uh, the whale when I saw that in theaters. Like the trailer for Ant Man. Yeah, the yeah. Quantum Mania or whatever. Yeah, I'm actually excited to see that one. I'm curious. I'll probably watch it. Yeah. Um, but no, I j- that's funny. They're probably related some way, like the Henry Cavill. Dwayne Johnson thing. I would I would have to imagine that this Black Adam thing's been in probably production forever, and it finally came out, and he was hoping to get into this kind of like what you do when you get into Marvel. He was hoping to make Black Adam when he still had hair. That was in like mid two thousands. What? Yeah. Jesus. Like he's been wanting to do Black Adam for so long, and then he finally does it, and it fucking sucks, and nobody watches it. I don't even know who direct. <laughs> it looks awful. Like I, I couldn't d- tell you. I sh- it yeah. looks so generic. Like yes, it looks like 2000 Superman. Yeah, 2006 Superman with uh, Brandon Routh or whatever his yeah. name was. Superman Returns. Like it's got like the same. Yeah, it doesn't look good. None of those DC. The only one that looked good was freaking Suicide Squad. And I'm not even going off of just with the characters and how it was like trying to. You know, it's James Gunn. That's because James Gunn has a voice. Like he has a personality. <laughs> like he gives his movies some kind of flavor. Yes. Yes, exactly. Like, yeah. Not just all CGI'd out and fucking sets and... Yeah, not just a Zack Snyder Dragon Ball Z fight. Let's go with, like, nine different shots of this guy flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super dark tone, like, really edgy, gritty. Yeah. James Gunn, at least, is, like, kind of fun and goofy. Well, he picks a tone of his movie and he sticks with it. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, he, he does a good... He's got a good entree. Yeah. You know, there's enough flavors there to satisfy you. There's like 60% protein, but then you get in your fats and your carbs and, you know, it all evens out. One of these days, we're going to do a double feature on this show of Suicide Squad and The Suicide Squad. (sighs) I know how much you're looking forward to that day. I haven't picked when I'm going to do it yet, but it's going to happen. It'll be great. Same with the uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks Quintilogy. Or sorry, Quadrilogy. There's only four of them. I think Quintilogy is five. It, neither of them sound good. <laughs> Once you get past one, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> Mac is just numb to the world. <laughs> I'm just staring at that red dot. Yeah. <laughs> that red, green, and blue dot just going back and forth. Oh, yeah. That'll be fun. That is Alvin, Simon, and Theodore. Um, Speaking of Henry Cavill, there's also one more piece of news that I wanted to touch on before we delve into the movies. Okay. Um. And it's kind of just like a topic that I wanted to talk about. Sure. I don't know how long we want to talk about it for since we have like three movies to cover. But I want to get your thoughts on it. So because Henry Cavill isn't doing Superman anymore. Right. Essentially, a couple days later, he came out and said, hey, I'll do any Marvel movie you want me to. Well, he said, well, it's funny you say that because people were wanting him to be the new James Bond. Oh, now that Daniel Craig left, which I can see them. I can see him doing that. Yeah. Um, But. Essentially, after a couple days of like the DC thing, he came out on Instagram with a pic, like a logo, like the Warhammer 40k logo. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like a video game, I guess. Um, but he came out with that, and he wrote about how he's going to start the process of making a Warhammer uh, TV show or mm. movie or something. I think it's a TV show. But he's, like, spearheading that. He's, like, working with an executive producer to, like, get that going. And he says he's going to, like, stay faithful to the source material. And like, He did The Witcher, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is, like, a big gripe that he had with that show is that they didn't stick with what the books were, which he's a fan of, I guess. But he's also a fan of Warhammer 40K, and so he's going to do that. And he said because he's spearheading it, he's going to make sure that the source material is good. Right. I want your thoughts on, because it's a video game, adaptation i feel like we've been seeing so many of those lately like there's a trend of video game adaptations so i wrote down that they're making a god of war show that's coming out on amazon why they're making a fallout show that's also coming out on amazon and then they got the warhammer 40k they've got the last of us show coming out on hbo max yes i don't know it just seems to be like the new trend that a little bit is taking place like it feels like it's coming in the dawn of maybe superhero movies kind of dying off well, in a way i don't know if i'd say dying off i think the new trend isn't necessarily um in, in video like i do agree because i mean I, I the last of us is coming out when i was thinking about the witcher and i think there was something else like on netflix that i saw that i was like oh this is mario is coming out in a mm-hmm. movie um 
two things. One, I think we're we're losing a lot of those creative juices, and as a society, we're becoming numb to what we like and what we watch. So it it fascinates us as we can get five different ways of viewing one thing, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, we're afraid of change. Yeah, we like the same stories. We don't like anything original is either like too difficult to make or just like too out there for them to make. Well, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I don't get. I don't know. I don't see. That's what I disagree with. But I, I also think too that the creative things that we go with have to be so eccentric or far out there, have to be so wide ranging or metaphorical that like you lose people because you're also doing it at the sake of being different. Mm. So yeah. like you don't just have your simple stories anymore. No. But um, you know the other the other aspect of it is uh, I I think what the what really is coming is we're gonna see more and more of these tv series there seems um, to be a lot of them not, yeah tv not, series specifically that are interconnected like we're like you know instead of making just the one three-hour film like why don't we just start making you know eight one-hour episodes mm-hmm. you know like i feel like there's more content behind it it's able to keep more fan involvement um the money that gets put into it i gotta imagine it might be just the same as if you're getting the same visual effects that you would in a movie i mean fucking the rings of power had like a billion dollars put into it like it's crazy how much money that show costs and it's not even that good (laughs) i mean that's you know and i think it'll get fine-tuned but like yeah i definitely feel like there's gonna be more of of these tv series coming out and these because these films are getting so much longer and they're not even like so you know. like a lot of times they're not even justifiably longer. Dude, Amsterdam was two hours and thirty minutes, and easily could have had forty minutes removed from it. That that's we- how. Uh, yeah, that's how I felt about Bardo, but that's more of like a, I don't know, kind of a. It was Inurito's new movie mm. that he came out with. That was like two and a half hours, almost three hours long. That was very dragged out. I don't know why we went to like putting more time into having us watch the movies Mm -hmm. the three movies that we just watched all 90 minutes all fantastic yeah it was such a fucking delight and it depends on the pacing too like the pacing of a movie if it's if it's like two and a half hours two hours 45 minutes and it goes by quick and it's justified then that's fine but yeah yeah i think i think you're right in that like it feels like some movies are just long for the sake of being long which you know if you're making a movie like that then why not just cut out all the necessary parts? Like, I don't know. It just it just feels like maybe some directors are afraid of, like, cutting stuff from their movies that they don't want to cut. I don't know. Could be. I have. I couldn't tell you. I just feel like movies are getting longer now. I feel like we're losing, like, the 90-minute movies are kind of becoming a dying art. And I don't know if it's because there needs to be more of what's going on in a movie that we have to be a little bit more attached. This could all be me just with, you know, recency bias, too. But, like... You know, I, I, I have a hard, I, we were, I was just talking about some, another movie to, with someone else today. I was like, that movie was like two hours and 40 minutes, you know, like mm. it doesn't, they don't need to be that long. And I think, but you know, and that's what I'm saying. I feel like we're getting closer to these TV series and being able to do two or three seasons of, you know, the last of us or like and the video game stuff or even hell. Yeah. Um, My fascination with it is more so from the angle of like people people just seem kind of obsessed with making shows or movies based on games that already have a story like it it, i don't know it's just kind of interesting to me how like people they sort of have this fascination with wanting to see the characters that they play in a video game on screen being portrayed by an actor being portrayed by like a studio i mean it's fun if you think about i mean there's so how much you play these video games like i'm playing uh days gone right now um and you know the cutscenes, the story the the what's driving him to get to these and then you know it takes me forever to play it to get 10 percent done with the game but you put it into a show you can eliminate all the fucking let's go find all these plants you know and get mm-hmm. you know find these ambush camps like yeah you just trim it to the storyline like it, it video games have always been very creative and what they can do and they can live in any world, in any society, in any universe, right? And mm-hmm. you can kind of pick out whatever you want. And there, it's because it's, you know, animated or whatever. I mean, yeah. you can kind of have it be in any vein you want it to. And I think because we're losing out on some of those creative juices, it's easier, easier to pluck source material and put it into 
you know, something and, and switch up a little oh, bit yeah. of what you want to see. I'm assuming a lot of it too is like it's safer to bet on an intellectual property that is already successful rather than maybe invest into something that's original and unknown. That could be maybe a factor in it too. I'm sure. I mean, there's uh, the you just Amazon you just named are what doing two of these things. Yeah, so they're doing the God of War show and they're doing the Fallout show. Which the Fallout show I feel like has a better chance of actually being its own thing kind of because fallout the whole appeal of it is it's an rpg game you make your own character you're in that world so what they are probably doing i'm assuming is they're they're creating a story within the world of fallout rather than trying to tell whatever story is from whatever game that they're basing it on whereas god of war you have to follow kratos like you have to follow that character and his storyline and you have to you, you have to make it about him it's that kind of, doesn't even sound like it's going to be that great. Well, the you know the Halo show, they follow Master Chief, but I mean they fucked up the source material so bad, and they they made it into a show that if you didn't know it was called Halo and like Master Chief wasn't in it, it would not be a Halo show. Like it's just totally its own separate thing that they kind of. It's like they skinned Halo and put the skin of Halo over another sci-fi story yeah, that they already had. <laughs> because you're taking someone that probably never played Halo and asking them to direct it. Exactly. I mean, like you got someone that's like, Halo can make a lot of money, and they're like, who's this Halo? They even came out and they said, the writers of the show, they said, yeah, we didn't play any of the games. We didn't read any of the books. Like We, kn- like, we have a very surface-level knowledge of the source material, and that's it. Like We know nothing of the lore. And it's like... Why are you making it a Halo show then? Like you're just gonna piss off the fans who are fans of the games and like that story and that character. Yeah. And then you're also not going to appeal to people who haven't played the games because it's just a shitty sci-fi show. Like, <laughs> I've got. I mean, I, I, yeah, it is. Pecu- I, I think we're starting. We're getting into a realm of. Uh, uh, we're plucking a lot of these things now and we're going to lose some of the creativity and there's going to be more of a drive on what's, like you said, intellectual properties. I mean, what, the source material is already there. You mm-hmm. know, like we're just going to be able to, boy, that did really well as a as a game. You yeah. know, let's get that going. Cause, and I think Marvel honestly kind of started it, but you're going to look at Marvel and go, well, we can scale this to a series as opposed to like everything that Feige did, mm-hmm. you know? And we're going to be able to, we could wrap this up in two, three seasons. Yeah. You know, I mean, they'll, at some point, this thing will be fucking tin canned. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It'll it'll come and go, and then there'll be a new trend. It'll be like neo vampires or something, like new wave of, of Twilight movies. <laughs> Couldn't tell you. I don't know what's going to, I think A24's got the best angle on, on leading the direction of the cause. Yeah. You know. I think uh I think they've got they've got a good vision for what they want. Yeah. But yeah, we're getting a lot of video game stuff. Cool. Just wanted your your thoughts on that. Uh speaking of thoughts, yeah. There was quite a bit of thought, I think, maybe, possibly, I don't know, put into the plot of Clue. Ooh. Which we both watched for yes. this episode. This was one of the films that won the poll for our 35th episode um did you want to take this movie or did you want me to take it i'll do do you want to do this because i mean i this i can okay i can do i can do clue let me just look up some info about it okay so clue uh we watched this movie it is a mystery black comedy film that came out in 1985. It is directed and written by Jonathan Lynn. Story by John Landis and Jonathan Lynn. Uh, based on the board game that came out. I don't know exactly when, but, you know, in the 20th century sometime. That's what I was kind of wondering, too, was, like... Was it when, based off the board game? No, no, no. not bit, Well, <laughs> it was what came first, the chicken or the egg. But I mean, at the end of it, I was like, "Oh, this is definitely based off the board game." But well, then in the cre- in the intro credits, they say "based off the board game." Mm. Clue. Didn't see that. So there's that. I did <laughs> rent it on YouTube, so they might have trimmed the fat. Oh yeah, they might have been like, "Yeah, get that out of here." Yeah, we'll just get, like right into the movie, or they did it and I wasn't paying attention. Mm. Either I won't put by anyone, so really no one's at fault. Starring uh, Eileen Brennan, Tim Curry, Madeline Kahn, Christopher Lloyd, Michael McKeon. 
our boy Chuck from Better Call Saul, uh, Martin Mull, and Leslie Ann Warren. So uh, it is about a group of people who are invited to a mansion. They are all given a, a pseudonym. I almost said pseudonym. That wouldn't have been right. Um, good thing <laughs> I didn't say that. Oh, lucky me. Uh, and they're gathered together because they are all being blackmailed into because they all have secrets that mm-hmm. they don't want getting out. And so uh, something happens uh, to where the lights go off, the lights come back on, and all of a sudden Mr. Body, who was the one blackmailing everybody, ends up dead. And everybody had a weapon, and nobody knows who did it. And so the mystery kind of unfolds from there. Chaos ensues, and uh, hijinks take place. Yes. So I think that's a good descriptor. Oh, um, yeah. Hell yeah. So this is my second time I've seen this movie. I don't know if you've seen this before. Uh, no, I had seen the end. The ends? And no, no. Plural? Just the end. The end? Okay. Yeah. So it's a. it was a very unique experience watching this Mm -hmm. and i saw it when i it was on tbs or tnt caught the last five minutes so Mm -hmm. i kind of was like oh this has got to be clue i mean you know it's kind of like one of those things as you go like i literally turned it on and did the thing with the light switch yeah and like all of a sudden they just started going to it and then the movie's over with and i was like i'm guessing that was clue (laughs) you know yeah when when Michael McKeon says it was me in the hallway with a gun, yeah, I'm gonna go and sleep with my wife. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, <laughs> that was. Which when I saw it, I was like, you know, because they do the still frame, mm-hmm. and I kind of had like a laugh. I was like, that's kind of just a funny way to end a movie. They so, I, if they put a laugh track in that moment, I would not have been surprised. <laughs> I would have still laughed. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, what did you think of this film? I so all right so yeah like I said um. You know, first time really watching the whole thing, seeing the whole thing. I I enjoyed this thoroughly. It's fun, right? Oh, a hundred percent. I this is honestly the best movie made on a, a game. I I think it's the only like I can't think of any other. I was talking to Megan about this earlier. I can't think of any other movie that's based on a real life board game. So I didn't even. I'm talking like I would. I'd put in video games in with this. really. Interest. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you'd yeah. have to go through. I don't think I would disagree necessarily, mostly because I can't think of any right now. You know, and I'm sure we could get some people that might say blah blah blah. I mean, I couldn't think of any off the top of my head, and I was like, because I did the same thing. I was like, man, this was a really good movie off you know a game, and then I was like, mm-hmm. well, do you count video games? And I was like trying to think of board games, and I I think, and then I started thinking of video games. I was like, no fuck, like I'll just go any game. Like this is yeah. This is one of the more original scripts that you could probably have with something of just here's a game, figure it out, and you could easily turn this into a David Fincher mystery. Right, take itself way too seriously. Exactly, and which they didn't. They had so much fun with it. Oh yeah, and you could tell everyone's having fun with it, and it's a little there's there's it's a little eighties, you know. Oh. Yeah, a little. <laughs> it's it's quite eighties, I would say. I would. It's on the cusp of not holding up. I don't. I don't know. I don't. No, I I completely understand what you're you saying. You know what I'm saying? It's like very close, like because it's it teeters. Like some of the jokes are really hard misses, mm-hmm. but then some of the other stuff that is like, you know, just very subtle humor. Well, they throw so much at you that even if a joke doesn't quite land, the yes. next joke probably will. Yes, like it's it's. It's how witty and quick it is mm-hmm. that Agreed. that makes this movie so fun. Like, I, I really like this film because it, it. I think it manages to balance like sort of the heart of what the board game is. It's like a fun, tongue in cheek, like murder mystery board game. Yes, it manages to like incorporate all those elements, like with the pseudo names and like the weapons and like the different rooms that people go into. Mm-hmm. But it also kind of comes into its own with like the script and how witty and. Yeah, how like specific each of the characters are. Mm-hmm. I think it's. I think it has like a good balance of those two things. I do too. I mean, it was very. I think it was very well done. And for a movie that's thirty seven years old, yeah, it's almost forty years old. Like right, I think it's uh, nineteen eighty five. Is that yes? Nineteen. Yeah. Yep. Nineteen eighty five. Yeah, like that's. I. That's. I'm saying it's like it. And for me, the reason why I would say it doesn't hold up is just because. Of, some of the dialogue, some of the jokes, a little bit of the acting. Vi- yeah, yes. Uh, how quirky it tries to be, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. it just kind of—it's you know, like we're just gonna run everywhere at the very end, where he's just—and it's like, 
there's a lot of moments where it kind of felt like you weren't really watching a movie you were watching like an improv sketch kind of yeah and sometimes it would take me out of it but Mm -hmm. other times it would kind of add to the whole sort of messiness of it well that's what i'm saying like uh yeah, it, this it, just like the chaos. So John, is it Landis or Landis wrote this and directed? Uh, John Landis. So this is a story by John Landis and Jonathan Lynn. Jonathan Lynn did the screenplay and he directed. Okay. Landis is another. He's a. He's a, another. Can you what? So he did. Um, so he's best known for the comedy films that he's directed, such as. Uh, National Lampoon's Animal House, The Blues Brothers, An American Werewolf in London, Trading he did Places, American Werewolf in London? Uh, Three Amigos, Coming to America, uh, yeah. and Beverly Hills Cop Three, I guess. <laughs> oh, nice. Is listed on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, it, it, yeah, for for being a, a comedy, they were like, well, we're just gonna have the board game, and then we're just gonna. That's the, like that's the high like high concept. Like, we just have the board game. That's mm-hmm. it. That's all. And then everything else is just funnels. No real storyline. We're just and it, they made it like you're playing the board game with them. Yeah. You know. I mean, and that's well, like the whole time you're watching it, it is a comedy. It is something that you can like laugh with and joke with. But at the same time, when they're exploring the house, when they're like who's doing it when there's like things that they insert like little details that kind of make you think like oh this person could have totally like been in this room like oh i like this person was the last person to enter this room like yep it it, it makes you think back to scenes that happened earlier and it's like well how important is this how important is this to the movie and how important is this to the story and you find out later that oh yeah these little details that i thought of are important that yeah Uh, like a lot of the time some of them they aren't well no i was gonna say like i it Yes and no because yeah, like those little details do count, but the it's such low stakes and there's you know there's they made three different endings for this thing. Yeah, and I did you read about that? I didn't read about it. No. They, well, I'm so, so they made three different endings, but in each in different movie theaters they ended with a with one of the endings. Mm-hmm. So John Landis, uh, when he or whoever no, I think it was I read John Landis. When he w- when he went to release this and give out the the films, he was hoping that if people heard there were three different endings, they would go and watch the movie again in hopes to get to a different ending. Oh yeah. So I think what they did in the final cut was put all of those three together. Mm-hmm. If I had to, you know, guess. If you were a guessing man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, so what my, my point being is like, yeah, it does. But at the same token, with the low like low stakes and it really didn't matter. Yeah, you know, because and that's some of the funness of the game that you play is that it doesn't end the same way every time you play the game. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It integrates itself into the game that way really well, kind of adding to that balance that I was saying about earlier. Yes. And also, the endings just sort of add to the cheekiness of it as a 100%. whole. Like it just adds to the cheese factor and the comedy of it, and how look, it totally could have turned out this way. Hey, you get to see Tim Curry repeat the same speeches that he made before, and you get to see him run around again. Yep. And that's fun. And I really like that they do that with this movie. I think Tim Curry is, like, really great Oh, in this. he fucking killed it. Mm-hmm. Like, he's so fun. He's, like, totally in, in into it the whole time. Like, I really like him as a, as a comedic actor. I think he's one that I don't think about as much as I should. He was in... He's in two cult... He's the leader of two cult films yeah, well he's in a rocky horror picture show and then what's the like, is this, this is a huge cult film i was gonna say is this the other one you're yeah, thinking of? like okay. you got that's what i was kind of you know i i think i i it's kind of funny that he's at the center of two movies that at the time did not do well and yeah. yet now we're like you know and, and anytime you talk about cinema you probably think it's a cinema snob would bring it up Definitely you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show for sure. This one I didn't realize that it took on a lot of popularity, you know, in the later years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Wikipedia says it later developed a considerable cult following, which I'm not also not shocked of why I got voted in for us to watch. Right? You know, <laughs> like I was like kind of I laughed about it after I read that. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Well, do you know who submitted it? Uh, Lauren. That's what I was going to guess. Mm-hmm. I remember, it's, yeah, she was the leader of the pack. Yeah, she, this was uh, one of her favorite movies, and so mm. she she wrote this down. I was actually kind of surprised that she didn't write down Little Miss Sunshine, because that's one of her favorite movies, and yeah. then I asked her about it. She's like, yeah, I didn't think about it until after I put Clue. Oh, well. Yeah. So, 
What? A, hey, I'm, I guess it worked out because we're talking about Clue. Yes. Um, yeah. What? Uh. So Tim Curry, did you have? When did you realize this thing was outdated? Uh, I think I realized that it was outdated when, um, I think when the cook died and they find her body and she kind of just tumbles out and she's just got the knife sticking out of her back okay. and just yeah. like the cheap kind of blood that they put on her. Like that was when I kind of realized that this movie was a little like, eh, yeah, this is an eighties film. Yeah. Like there's not much going into this. Like it, it's not like the biggest budgeted film ever made like fucking, like lethal weapon was coming out at these times like (laughs) (laughs) yeah so i mean but i mean it's a comedy like the the whole appeal of it is not the effects or like the datedness of it or like kind of the there's also a scene too where the police officer is talking on the phone and they're like talking about he's like talking about something and the the pipe comes up behind him like someone sneaking up behind him to kill him yeah that's another moment that made me realize how dated this movie was just like the effects and like the screams and like the puh, puh, yeah ah, like that kind of thing yeah it almost sounds like a video game npc dying when you kill them <laughs> ah, they just fall over yeah so that was another moment but i mean you know it kind of it kind of gives it some charm it gives it some sort of like kind of time capsule element to it because it's so dated and because this movie came out like almost 40 years ago that well that's what i'm saying i mean it's really impressive that i mean there's a lot I th- there's a lot of movies from the 80s that like you know you try to have someone watch and they're just like mm. well and i wonder too like at the time because i mean video games they had arcades and stuff but they weren't really like a mainstream household thing uh at this time like i think the super i think the nes came out like 1985 exactly so people probably were just playing board games more as like a social thing. Clue was probably like really popular. That's what I was gonna, that's what I was kind of wondering too. Yeah. Like I I I'm This was the first movie made on a board game. Mhm. So how popular was Clue? Like you're telling me Clue is more popular than Monopoly? I mean, it probably was up there. I don't know if it'd be co- like considered more popular, but Right. Um I'd have well, to ask my parents. I'll tell you profit margins say differently. <laughs> I'd have to ask my parents. I remember I remember playing Clue with them when I was a kid mm-hmm. and having a lot of fun with it. Like, oh, Colonel Mustard with the wrench in the library or whatever. Yeah. Like it's it's fun. And my friends even we played like a card game version of Clue like two weeks ago. Oh, and really? yeah, that was a lot of fun. Like it was it was weird because it was like almost like a puzzle game in a mm-hmm. way like you had to match certain cards with stuff and you needed like a key on a card to uh, like unlock certain parts and then you add it to the board and it was it was fun yeah it was, it was almost too complicated for me because i'm like well what's going on here <laughs> um yeah <laughs> but <laughs> my my simple caveman brain um but no i i'm i'm sure like they were banking on like oh this is like what people do for a social thing let's make a whole movie with this and then people will enjoy it so i think they i mean i I think they did a great job with it no they they really did they did a good job of like capturing the tone and like kind of the quirkiness and like it's a tone that kind of it butts heads with itself but in a good way so like it presents itself as a very like fancy like oh it's like a dinner party we're gonna dress up we're gonna get together we're gonna have a good time but it's totally wacky the entire time with the like very op- physical humor opening i would not have guessed is where the movie was gonna go to they do there's a couple things by the way you talk about fucking 80s <laughs> uh, oh with christopher lloyd's character yeah mm-hmm. professor plum pulls up they get there and professor they, grope <laughs> oh my god grabs her ass and they do like the shot of it yeah. i was like that was unnecessary mm-hmm. i was like i think they're probably letting us know about his character yeah you know but then how they also dressed up Yvette, the the housemaid. Oh, yeah. Well, she came into auditioning like that. Oh, really? Yeah, they had it. Her accent was, like, so fucking bad. <laughs> was, I didn't even... I didn't... I, <laughs> Monsieur, I've been here this whole time. Like it's, <laughs> it's, well, It sounds like it's almost French, kind of. I don't know, man. I, was, like, I read that today that she dressed up like that as a housemaid, showed off a lot of cleavage, and they, they were like, yeah, ultimately we gave her the part because, you know, fucking white old guys. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> this will get ju- people in the movies. I just thought about Blonde and what she had to do to get into her first role. I was like, Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was that was pretty distracting, I would say. I mean, arguably, it's like 
you oh, know her in that outfit the point of her character but yeah oh dude it was totally like that's what you know that's what you did though in the 80s i mean everyone had you know you showed tits you had the people ran around naked you had fun mm. it was like smoking weed and laughing and it's like whatever no one's gonna think that we're womanizing <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know yeah there's a lot there's a lot of dated elements to this movie for sure yes um but i like i said but the the beginning of the film i mean kind of where they were at and what they were like the with the lightning and people kind of guessing and figuring like how what are you doing here what do you it could have went into like a very freaking fincher way it could have you know but it felt more like scooby-doo than it did <laughs> a david the fincher way, zodiac movie yeah <laughs> i mean the way i'm just saying well in the 80s though, i'm saying like you, i don't think you like nowadays yeah 100 percent. but back then like i could I could see that, like, and them still doing like a real murder mystery with all those elements going on, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, totally not reading the room. No, like, completely missing the mark. But yeah. it's it's good that they went the way that they did. Yeah, fantastic. What did you think of uh, our boy Michael McKeon, Chuck from Better Call Saul? Yeah, little, I thought strapping young man. Really interesting seeing him. I keep trying to think of other films that he's in. That I've seen. I mean, you know, better, better call Saul. The only right? th- other thing I've seen him in is a sketch for, on Mr. Show, which was Bob Odenkirk's show that he had with David Cross. Um, so it, and it's funny That's because an interesting pairing. Well, it's funny because he was in a skit with Bob Odenkirk that had to do with lawyers. Which I thought was kind of kind of funny. Maybe that's why they went with him. I mean, he's already got the you know. Who knows? He has comedic chops. Oh, he was he. I didn't even think he was like all that funny in this until the like the very end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the very end like is where his character really like stands out. Like otherwise, he's just pretty much just a part of the group. Yeah, he's not noticeable. I mean, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, so outside of Tim Curry, because Tim Curry like man nailed this. Oh yeah, he's a hundred percent steals the I show know as what Wadsworth. Happened to his career. Like I feel like I um, should have saw more Tim Curry. I think he, I think he has some kind of disease that prevents him from acting. acting. Like I think he's wheelchair bound. Like Ooh. he's, yeah. I think he's like mentally okay. Like he's has his faculties and he's like, he's able to like talk to people. But in terms of like being physically able to move, I don't think he can as much as he did before. Right. I think that prevents him from doing a lot I more. His last movie. I gotta see this now. I don't know. He he was in um. Uh, he was Nigel Thornberry in the Wild Thornberries on Nickelodeon. That makes sense. Smashing. I don't know if you've ever. Of course, that, I saw the movie in theaters, dude. You saw Come at me, bro. You saw uh, Rugrats and the Wild Thornberries movie. Was that the movie you're talking about? Because that's the movie I saw. No. Well, you're you're younger than me. That no. was the 4D scratch and sniff. No, I. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> uh, no, I, it was original. It was the first Wild Thornberries movie that came out in 2003. I went mm. on a double date and saw it. I was eight years old, I'm pretty sure. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to watch the Wild Thornberries. They were on uh, Nickelodeon. Dang, you were going on dates? I didn't even know what dates were at that time, dude. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there, it was with uh, a, a nice young lady named Anne, but my friends called her Anne the Man, so I had to break up with her. Oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> Poor Anne. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Anne, if you're listening. Probably not. Okay. Well, we're not revealing anything, but no, I got it. It was a, it was a lovely double day. I'm sitting here like looking up the wild. Th- so i pretty sure it was 2003. Okay. Oh no, that's when Rugrats go wild. No. Is that? Mm, mm, I was. I thought that was. Wild Thornberry movie came out in two thousand two. Okay. When was when was Rugrats go wild? Because that was the two thousand three. Thorn- really? Yeah. I thought it was later than that, but well, you might have saw it later than that. Maybe. I I remember seeing it in theaters though, because I had the scratch and sniff thing. You got it from Burger King. And you had to bring it to the theater, and whenever the symbol popped up on screen, you had to scratch it with a coin and then sniff it, and then you'd smell like it'd have like a fishy smell if like the wild kid was eating fish, or it'd have like a coconut smell if like a coconut fell on someone. Like it's just, it was really like of the time. That's bizarre. Yeah. (laughs) Boy, Burger King partnering up with. It was just on the eve of 3D for movies, I guess. 4D scratch and sniff. 4D, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Can you just call it a scratch and sniff? Um, they had to call it 4D. Right. It's all the experiences. I'm surprised they didn't go with 5D. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, you were saying about actors other than Tim Curry. Yeah. In this movie. Yeah. <clears throat> I almost. It sounded like I was crying there, but I'm not. I swear. This movie just gets me emotional. Yeah. Not quite as much as the whale, but you know. Uh, t- tell me about it. Um, I mean, Christopher Lloyd's fun. He's wacky. Mm-hmm. He's a little. He's a little perverted, kind of. But <laughs> yeah, um, a little. He's he's a very like f- like f- expressional actor in terms of like the faces that he makes and like mm-hmm. his movements. I liked him as a character. Um, Miss Scarlet, I think, was not like other than Yvette. I don't think she was like the best actor in the movie. Like she, right. she was just very like one note kind of like, oh, I I I'm the head of a bunch of prostitutes, like you know that yeah. kind of thing. Um, I don't know, Colonel Mustard, he was okay. He's just kind of like a military man. Mm-hmm. Mrs. White played her part. Like a lot of the characters, they're just like one dimensional. Mm-hmm. Like there's not any nuance to them because the movie really isn't about the characters. It's just what the characters do in order to situationally yeah. place in these events and mm-hmm. almost kind of like what we were discussing with Wes Anderson earlier. Like it's the the whole appeal of the movie is the setting, is the situation. Like the mansion in this movie feels like a character. Yes, 100%. And I think that's like the appeal of it. I mean, that's essentially the appeal of the board game. Like you don't Well, yeah. Like the characters in the board game, they don't they don't mean anything. Like they're just there. Wow. I know. I'm sorry, Colonel Mustard. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to to generalize okay. you. Yeah. Um but yeah, I I think the focus is mostly just like the setting and the situation. And that's what the movie does right. 100%. Mm-hmm. 100%. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about with this, or you think we should wrap this up? Um, oh, I was just, I was just thinking. <laughs> yeah, that was. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think there's. Oh, uh, and this is just a quick one-off, but I just like to express myself. I did like that they use a lot of like political. Was in, like oh yeah literally political angle in this one so many of the jokes are so witty well no i'm not even talking the joke like just about what brought them all together mm-hmm. i thought it was very funny that they took something of that <laughs> like unrealistic yeah and just sort of like yeah we're gonna throw it in here and yet they linked all of them together but mm-hmm. i also think that added to some of the mystery and you trying to figure out what was going on and how they're all like who had the worst dirt? I think Tim Curry says three times, Commun- communism was a red, red herring. <laughs> Jesus, dude, learn to fucking speak. God, man. Two. Two times? Two times. Yeah, the first one with the prostitution, communism didn't have anything to do with it. But uh-huh. The next two times it did. <laughs> but then I thought it was really funny because it plays a red herring, and then I'm like, this whole film's a fucking red herring. Oh, yeah. You know, so like it was kind of funny that... He's actually like just talking to the audience members that like you thought all of this was politically connected. It's not. Oh yeah. You know. There's so many times where it's just so purposefully tongue in cheek and like very self aware. Yes. Like there's the joke about like, ah, my husband, he was a socialist. (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) Like just really like absurd shit. Like it's so funny and it's like kind of making fun of the attitudes at the time because I think this film takes place in like what 1957 or something. That one I didn't catch. I think it, I think it's said in the beginning, like the opening crawl. So there's got to be like... Oh, 1954. Like, yeah, so like right when the Red Scare was was mm-hmm. already in effect or... Yeah, when close. people were paranoid about communism and right. the Cold War was, was really starting to ramp up and everything. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I must have missed that. I mean, I, I put this thing on and I sat there and watched it the whole time. I don't remember any... Like, uh, Anyways, yeah, they they do a good job of making fun of that and like poking, like satirizing those situations. Yeah, I thought it was good. Um, we can wrap this up. Uh, wrap it, wrap it. I'm gonna give this one an eight out of ten. <whistles> really enjoyed it. Same. Nice. Yep. Went on there today and put eight out of ten down. Excellent. Yeah. Four stars for me on Letterbox. This is a good cheeseburger movie, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoy cheeseburgers just in general, but yes, I, I understand what you mean. I think, you know, this is a good this is a good one that you could really throw on. And so I don't 
I don't know. Some people say sink your teeth into it. You don't sink into it. I, think- I will say I think I had more fun with it when I was watching it with my friends mm-hmm. than I did just by myself. Because watching it with my friends, you kind of get caught up in like the humor of it. Mm-hmm. At least I do anyway. I think I mentioned in a previous episode how I'm like very easily influenced by other people laughing at something. <laughs> So that's not too surprising, but I mean, for me personally, I think it helps my enjoyment of it. Yeah. So I really, I I haven't watched it. I, I had to laugh because I didn't, you know, it was all new to me until the very end. And I was like, oh, I remember this, Mm. you know, (laughs) Hey, this is familiar. Yeah. Then we got to that point. I was like, wow. I, I, you know, anyways. Yeah. It had time. Great movie. Thank you. Excellent. Um, speaking of, of thank yous. I'm going to say a big thank you to Smash Mouth for providing some music for the next film we're going to talk about. I am, of course, talking about Shrek. Bada bing, bada boom. Shrek Shrek. is love. Shrek is life. Can you do that? Can you do the Shrek? Shrek? Well, are you saying Shrek's name as Shrek? Remember when he goes like, what's your name? Uh, and he looks at the Shrek? camera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I it's get what you bad. mean. Normally, I just go to the default like donkey. <laughs> like I usually, that's usually just what I default to when I'm impersonating Shrek. Yeah. Or like the maybe he's compensating for something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I got this. I got Clue. If you want to get this one, and then I can get Shrek two. Wow, you're taking two out of three. Well, do you? All right. Do you want me to get this one? Mm, I can do and this And then one. you can do Shrek. Okay. No. This is this is probably the only one that I know I had seen. I'd seen Shrek 2, but a long time ago at the drive-in. Oh, okay. Uh, so anyways, uh, Shrek. Shrek 2001's uh, Shrek directed by Andrew Adamson, written by William Stieg, based upon the book by... Oh, wait. The book is William, William Stieg, Stieg. Written by Ted Elliott. Terry Rosario, Joe Stillman. Boy, there's a lot of stuff in here. Mm. All right. Uh, starring Mike Myers as the titular Shrek. Donkey. Eddie Murphy. Uh, Cameron Diaz as Princess Fiona. John Lithgow. Fiona. Farquad. Vincent Cassell. Monsieur Hood. And anyways, and that's about it. Uh, what? I didn't know that character was called Monsieur Hood. That's funny. I don't even know who is that. The guy that he's was... the guy. He's the executioner th- with uh, Farquad. The guy with the three, pick three, my lord. Pick three, my lord. And he yeah. holds out. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so everyone, I feel like everyone knows it. Shrek's about. It's about you know a uh, uh, fairy tale following an ogre who uh, gets a swamp. Eat. Uh, what do they do? They don't evict them, but they. It's almost like uh, eminent domain. Yeah. They, they well, they get they get displaced. The swamp. Yeah, yeah, they get displaced onto his swamp. Yeah. So he's got to go and he's got to go save a princess to get everyone off of his swamp. Yes. And it's a, a frolicking story that's very wholesome. Mm-hmm. Very wholesome. Yeah. No so, edginess to it at all. <laughs> uh, uh, no. What were you gonna say? Nothing. What did you think? I mean. <laughs> I mean, I li- I really like this movie. I yeah. I think that it's it's a classic. It's yeah culturally important, which is weird to sh- say about Shrek because it's meme to death. But I think that's part of why it's culturally important. Like it's it kind of set like a stage for like DreamWorks as a studio and kind of set the ball in motion for like all those movies to come out, mm-hmm. where it sort of marketed itself as like the animated movie that's not made by Disney. Like this is the movie that you kids are going to see when you're like teenagers or whatever. Like it's, it, it's definitely kind of like poking fun at like the Disney formula in a way of like following oh. characters who are like cutesy and bubbly and like the happily ever after. Like it's just kind of making fun of that concept. hundred percent. Like literally the movie opens up with Shrek in the story and he tears a piece off and he goes <laughs> that like that'll ever happen. And yeah. he like wipes his ass with it as he's in his outhouse. Like he's, it's very clearly like making fun of that. And I think that just thinking about that as a concept with Shrek as an ogre, I think it's just pretty funny. And I just like the movie too. Yeah. Like, I just think that it's a good computer animated film. 100%. Yeah. So this came out in 2000. 2001. 2001. Uh, I was at a uh, sleepover birthday party, I think. Mm. 
And uh, yeah, when did the Phantom Menace come out? Phantom Menace was 99? 99. Okay. No, I the, think. The, the, it's or was all... it 97? 99. Okay. Had to have been 99. I thought it was 2000. Mm. Maybe it was still in theaters then? Let me let me verify. Yeah, verify at this because it all kind of um, buddy, you know, buddies in, in, in 1999. Yeah, Phantom Menace? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we're so six. Uh, yeah. So, like sixth, seventh grade, uh, sleepover, you know, it's. Uh, it's the whole neighborhood for one of our buddies. It was his birthday party, you know. So we're no one went to bed till like five, six a.m. Mm-hmm. You know, and the next day we're gonna go watch Shrek for you know his birthday party. Every kid fell asleep in the theater. I being one of them. Oh no! I've made it thirty-five minutes through this thing, passed out. Uh, they woke me up with the dragon. I can't remember when I fuck. I woke up, got home, slept even longer. I was like, well, how's the movie? It's like, ah, yeah. it was all right, you know, because I was in and out of it the whole time. Right. Little did I know <laughs> that this thing was going to be fucking huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that it, it would just be totally lost on you. Just, oh, I guess this movie is like one of the biggest kids movies ever. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it was kind of like, right, you're in middle school, so you're getting more of like, I want to see more of the Scream movies and I want to see the Shrek movies and you don't even catch up on the... I mean, the juxtaposition of what's going on, you know, and some of the humor with it. I just remember I passed out. So I didn't see this thing again until Christmas when it came out, and we rented it from Blockbuster on VHS. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents were watching it. And the funny part is I actually fell asleep for the first half of the movie and woke up when the time I fell asleep in the theaters. Oh, you you watched it one time total. Piecemealed it together. Pretty much. <laughs> so That's funny. Ended up getting it for Christmas, dude, and then all of a sudden it's it's Shrek, you know? Yep. So I mean, it was I, I this thing is absolutely I mean, it's hard it's it's crazy. This thing is 20 years old, but I mean, it's still I think this one holds up 100 like I think you could show this in another 15 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And, I think the jokes for sure and like what it's going for and kind of what it's satirizing yes. definitely holds up and like the cultural relevance of it. Mm-hmm. Like Shrek is just such a part of like meme culture and like just culture in general of like when people quote things or like talk about movies. Like the character of Shrek is just so ingrained in our minds. Yes. He's like as famous as like Spider Man or fucking Batman at this point. Like it's. It's crazy how much his character has just permeated throughout our culture. Yeah, it's wild. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, I, you couldn't. I don't think you could. You could have dictated or not dictated, but guessed that that was going to happen. Yeah, you know. I mean, there isn't like that. This thing's coming out, and you're like, oh man, this is going to be freaking wild, and it's going to take hold of so many different things. No, like they they definitely didn't know the success that it was going to be when they were making this movie. Like they no. were just like, we're just gonna take a risk and make it and yeah. see how it goes. And they might've been taking a shot. Like you said at Disney and just said, F it. Like they're coming out with all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Did they own Pixar at that point too? I mean, I know Pixar is its own branch. I don't know if they owned Pixar yet. They could have like Pixar was made by, was it Steve jobs that made Pixar? He, it was a lot of the Apple guys. I don't know. The if whole specifically the whole yeah. thing was made by, Steve Jobs and Apple. Well, like I mean, I'm not di- t- entirely sure on that. Disney did have a hold on those fairy tales, Cinderella. Yes, and, you know, so they definitely took. Mm-hmm. They're like, we're gonna pull out all the punches and yeah, in a very kid way. Oh yeah, for and sure. Even the jokes that are like you would deem inappropriate, like really, even aren't that inappropriate. No, like they're they would what well, the ones that are kind of inappropriate they'd just be completely lost over kids' heads. So like when I saw this movie for the first time, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I definitely wasn't any older than like ten years old. Mm-hmm. So I watched the movie and I thought to myself like, yeah, it was it was okay, but as a kid, I think what kind of turned me off of it a little bit was the way that they portrayed some of the jokes like. Like I, I remember being a kid and the scene where the bird explodes just kind of disturbed me a little bit. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I had the exact same thought. Like it made me feel really uneasy. Like I hadn't seen that in a movie before. She just killed something. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, that bird is just dead. Yeah. And it's not coming back. Like normally in cartoons, like, oh, something happens to where something like blows up. They come back. Yeah. No, this isn't. 
that that's not what happened no, in the movie. Actually, it's funny that you say that. Like, there's two things. The other one that got me was those balloon animals. That's the other one I was thinking of. Yeah, like when they just like let them go and float away. I was like, they're not coming down. No, like those <laughs> things are gone. They're dead. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're going into the atmosphere and, and it's choking. It's supposed to be such a fun. But now you watch it, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Still disturbing. Uh, <laughs> you watch it and it's still disturbing, but like it's funny because obviously they're not real and right. like it's no, it's to match the tone of like, wait a minute, these people are disgusting, but they're also like in love and happy. Like, yes, I, I don't know. It's just the tone of it was lost on me when I was a kid. No, uh, but well, as not- I grew up, I got it a little bit more. It's about to say, oh, still not quite there with it, but yeah. <laughs> no, uh, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think you could kind of tell that they were poking fun. I mean, for me at least, I could tell that they were poking fun at it. Mm-hmm. But it just it doesn't really. It didn't like until we just kind of talked about it. You know, it's like oh, they're really like. If, now that I think about it, this, really feels like DreamWorks going sort of like fuck Disney, mm-hmm. like literally. Oh yeah, not like in uh, you know, this wasn't like oh, we got to combat them. Like this is gonna be a fun. Like they were pretty much like if this fails or fucking works, who cares? Yeah, like when they go to do lock. And they they have like the little singing little puppet people come mm-hmm. up and they start singing. You yeah, know, don't touch the grass. Shine your shoes. Wipe your face. face. <laughs> Which always stuck in my mind. Same that here. whole that whole thing. It seems like it's making fun of like Disney World and like that kind of whole. They took that. That's that was a Disney. <sighs> Sing it! I can't remember exactly what tune it was, but they took that tune from I think Disney property and I, I, yeah, churched I, it up a little bit. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I was just reading some of the trivia on the stuff today, and that was one of the things that I just kind of I grazed over, and so you know, because for some reason I thought DreamWorks was a part of Disney. Like I, I it kind of blew my mind that they were able to take like cinderella and sleeping beauty and you mm-hmm. know and i'm like i is i thought those were original content but i don't know if I they think, went public domain i think they might have been public domain yeah because i've you know like because well, like cinderella and snow white are based on older like folklore so you could so that's so i think that's kind of like the argument they can make is like oh we're not basing this off of disney we're basing this off of the yeah. older folklore when clearly they are basing it off of Disney. Right. That's <laughs> what I was getting into that little bit in my head argument of like, I don't know if this is obviously they can do it cause they did, but like, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like was this a bigger deal that I just didn't remember? Like, how are they getting away? You know? So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that, and that's kind of like one of the fun, and that's it. You know, here we are talking about a PG movie Shrek and like how DreamWorks is fun, <laughs> taking shots, basically at giving and, the middle finger. To are Disney. we in some copyright infringement zone? And mm. not only that, how about uh, the rise of Facebook? Oh yeah, I mean, like I I got into this thing and I was I was joking with just Jack. the memes in general. No, nah, I'm just talking about the actual Facebook logo being all over this. I thing. did. It did look like the Facebook logo. <laughs> like I had to Google it. I was like, "Did Mark?" So I, I was me and Jasmine watched this, and I made I gave I made up some story and told her, and she's like, "Oh, really?" It's like, no. But I did end up. I was like, "Did Facebook like did Mark Zuckerberg like have some sort of affinity with Shrek?" And like, here we are, you know. He, he, he that'd be is, funny if he based wild. the logo off of lord farquad's emblem basically it, blue and white with the white lowercase f yeah. like it's very distinct hey i it uh, yeah i did think oh wow that's the facebook logo yeah even though it's clearly not but well it, and they, it looks it will, like it and this came out in 2001 and facebook wasn't launched till 2004 so i mean mm-hmm. you know the, but i did think i was wondering i was like what this just feels all too close with association. Oh yeah, you know, but like, uh, you know, the the subtleties and the intent aside, I I think it's also just like a solid movie in terms oh. of like the characters and the story. Like the story is pretty simple, but I mean, it's the characters I think that really kind of drive it and like the relationships that they have with each other like shrek and donkey's relationship, shrek and fiona's relationship, lord farquaad as a character. Like they're just really fun and they they're so like they're so quirky and like personality driven shrek especially yeah because like he's a character that actually feels like he has nuance and and layers you know he has the speech where onions or ogres are like onions they're stinky and you leave them in the sun too long they turn brown no they have layers donkey ogres have layers onions have layers like he has that whole speech that's like basically the point of the movie it's like there's more to a person or an ogre than what people see right and 
I don't know. I, I think it just fundamentally works as oh, 100%. as part of the movie. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I it it feels like any other fairy tale that's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? it's making fun of fairy tales while also simultaneously being a fairy tale. Right. Like it's kind of along the same lines as Hot Fuzz or Shaun of the Dead, where it's poking fun at those types of genre movies while also being a good genre movie in its own right. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's it. You know, they take it, and I think maybe they they do more introspection with the characters and what you get in those other fairy tale movies where it is Cinderella as the, you know, take me to the ball, you know, whatever, get the glass slipper. And she isn't really a reflection of, or at least speaks as a reflection of what she sees herself as. It's always what I could be Mm -hmm. where it Shrek's the exact opposite. It is, I know exactly what I am and I wish people would see me for more than just that. Yeah. So it's a funny way that they kind of do, like I said, a juxtaposition of what's going on, you know, with simultaneously balancing two different tones. Yeah. You know, like he has those serious conversations in the movie with Donkey mm-hmm. and it's 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 almost it can almost ride the line of being too absurd because it's a it's literally an ogre character talking to a talking donkey. No, that's not absurd at all. But that's what I'm saying is that it's. It, it works because those characters are so well written, and because the movie's so well written. Like they, yes. they have actual moments of dialogue that feel uh, organic to yeah. the story. Like it feels like it belongs. It doesn't feel out of place, even though it's a movie with a literal ogre who fucking takes earwax out of his ear and makes a candle out of it. You know, I didn't like that scene because it's how did he get the wick? <laughs> Honestly, I think like, it's a hair. That's exactly. Yeah, there's a hair growing out of ear. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, I watched that scene. I've always thought he lit just the wax, and then I'm like, "Well, wax doesn't light on fire." Mm. And I was like, "Oh, it's an ingrown hair." In yeah, his there's ear. like a ear hair that's just stuck in there. But what did he? It can't grow out of wax. It has to grow out of you know. So like, it had to have collect. Anyways, <laughs> I watched it. That's the only thing that really annoyed me in this thing. The deeper implications of why there's hair growing on his ear wax. Yeah. Well. You'd have he'd have to pluck it out of his skin, but the wax would have to be hardened around it, which I could get behind that. But then there won't be a, you know, at the I don't know. It just doesn't. Where's it growing at? <laughs> yeah. yeah, DreamWorks, we're sending emails. <laughs> get ready. <laughs> you better believe it. Look for the subject pissed off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah, fucking phonies. Look for the subject urgent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Read now. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to email Mr. Dreamwork himself. Mr. Works? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Mr. Works. Mr. Dream Works. Hello. Is Mr. Works there? Yeah. Please call me Dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The whole tone of it is just kind of like it's gross, but it's it's appropriate. If it's what he is. Yeah. Like he's gross physically and therefore like all the things around him are gross like it's you know it, it fits the tone it fits like the tongue cheek of it it's it, like, gross but it's not like gross you know what i'm saying it yeah. is but it isn't like he does the mud bath but at the same token you're not like because they don't make it look like shit right you know so i mean like yeah i mean he plucks the earwax but at the same it's kind of that fits there, in with what he you know what i'm saying there is the one scene though that i kind of thought was a little gross it's when He's like pushing mud through the log or something oh, and those slugs. to like get it start to run, and it lo- it like I'm pretty sure that's meant to look like someone taking a shit. Okay. Like it, lo- <laughs> it looks like uh, someone. I do. It, right it looks like poop. credits. Yeah, it looks like yeah. poop coming out of a butthole. This is what that looks like. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I could at, the, yeah. at that moment, it, like, and I hadn't even noticed it before when I watched this movie, but oh. watching it now, I'm like, oh wow. That's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, they're really setting the tone. But that's really the only moment where I kind of felt that. Like that, yeah, I was about to say. I mean, it, like it's 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 like little kid gross, but it's kind of like humorous gross. It's not like yeah, like oh, it's funny how he like ripped the earwax out and made a yeah. candle out of it. Like, yeah. Oh look, he's crushing these eyeballs that he has a jar of, but he's making a nice sandwich out of it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just it's just funny, funny gag humor like that mm-hmm. that I think just works. Agreed. Like visual gags that just work in the world of where he lives in. Um. Yeah, the voice acting I think is really good too. Like I think Mike Myers is Shrek. Like I can't picture anybody else potentially so, voicing him. 
And the, I, I think you're going to bring up the same thing that I'm thinking about, Chris Farley. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you ever watch the the? Uh, they have the cartoon drawings with Chris Farley doing the voice. Yeah, I listened to them a long time ago. Like I haven't, I haven't re-listened to them recently. I was going to before we recorded, but I forgot to. Yeah, but I, I saw. I I didn't even know that it was a thing until probably like a month or two ago. Oh, really? And it popped up on Facebook, and it was like, yeah, because it'd been in works for like six years or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like that, it's so crazy to me. Like Black Adam, like you're saying, like The Rock, like he probably did the fucking pitch, and they're like, yeah, we just created the DCU, let's do it 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like they just got Black Adam made. Yeah, isn't that wild to think about? Like Chris Farley was still alive and was doing reads for Shrek. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. that's how long that had been in like the making. Yeah. Well, it's crazy to me too. Like he just used his normal voice. Like it was just Chris Farley's voice. Like he didn't have an accent or yeah or anything really like too distinguishing for the character. And then they you got know, Mike Myers, and then he didn't either. What what I read, they they had they did some takes with him, and they there's actually I guess in like one of the DVDs and like the extras, mm-hmm. you can watch the video with him just doing like his kind his, of american voice yeah like he took after he did the scottish thing because like they he wanted to add like a thicker layer and he, he based it on like because his mom had that thick accent oh i didn't know that yeah like it was one of the things yeah it's just isn't that wild i thought he did it to set himself apart from chris farley and like the voice that he did but I don't. So the whole thing that, that could I, be wrong too. I and I, 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 this is all you know from what just like findings on the internet. But mm-hmm. um, right. He he originally wasn't going to take the role, um, because is he was friends with Chris Farley and he passed and he thought it'd be disrespectful to do that and take the role from. Now, granted, that could just be an actor being like, this movie's not going to be that great, you know, but um. He originally wasn't going to do it, and then he he the producers talked him into it. So, I guess one of the rallying cries or whatever they said was, "Let's settle this over a pint. Let's go out. Let's settle this over a pint." Mm-hmm. And that line makes it into the movie where he gets it. You know? And oh he, yeah, when he's like, "Can't we just talk about this over a pint?" And yeah, then he like yeah, smacks yeah. the barrel and he, floods everybody. Yeah. So they wrote that in there because that's a, the producers eventually talked him into like, "You're it's not it wouldn't be disrespectful. Your buddy would love you to do this." Mm-hmm. And then I read they did some takes with him, and he was trying to find the right accent, and it wasn't until he... So I think they have different takes of him talking in different ways, or at least I don't know how long they went before they settled on it, because, like, you know, well, and it's all voiceover, too, so they could have did the whole animation and just had it paired him up until they found the right one that made, you know, sounded right, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's probably easier to get the voice recording, though, first, and then animate it, so then you can... Match the lips. Yeah. So I'm assuming anyway. Could be. I mean, I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, Eddie Murphy is donkey too. It's like yeah, really appropriate. Like he does a really good job of voicing donkey. He brings like so much energy to the character and like he's just all around like really good at voicing that high energy character. I mean, he has experience with it. He voiced Mushu in, is that his name? Mushu? In, uh, in um, yeah, the Disney movie. Mulan. We're trying to stay away from <laughs> Kyle. Uh, <laughs> not the live action one. Um, I don't think Mushu was in that one. Uh, but I mean, he's got experience with that type of thing too. And like Cameron Diaz does a good job. And um, fucking, they all did. John Lithgow as Lord Farquaad, which I mean, his name is just funny. Farquaad, fuckwad. Yeah. <laughs> And, like, Farquaad as a villain, too, I think is really fun. Like, just the idea of, like, just a short, short, like, power-hungry, like, I want to I wanna find a queen and marry her, and, like, yeah. so I can be king. <laughs> Some of you may die, but that is a sacrifice I am willing to make. <laughs> like, there's so many iconic moments in this movie that oh I just Oh, like, the whole movie is. There isn't, like, literally the only times that they aren't, is probably when they they after the married men because mm-hmm. even donkey when he's like oh my god oh my god you're gonna die shrek yeah. he's like pick the red flower he's like i'm calling one i don't know what one and then he hears <laughs> yeah. the scream and he grabs it uh-huh like it's literally after that like when they're laying down probably doing like the, the very you know in in depth conversations you know the two nights of it and uh when him and him and uh 
the princess kind of go through the uh, the forest, you know, romping with, at you know, they're in love, mm. you know. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Those, like there's so there's probably twenty minutes of the thing. Other than that, the whole film is people bring it up, and every every scene's probably talked about in different ways. So the one scene that I didn't remember from this movie. Because I had a pretty good like timeline of the movie in my head of like how it went. The one that I completely spaced was the Robin Hood scene. Really? Yeah, that's the oh, only one dude. that I didn't remember was in the movie until I rewatched it this time. I'm like, oh yeah, this is here. I love their song. I love the song and that they break out and dance and then she just comes out and just beats her ass. Oh yeah, they do a fucking Matrix reference where she freeze frames in the in the middle of the air and just like double kicks the two guys. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just so funny. Like yeah. I, it's like the action is very like kind of psh, 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 like very like quick animated and oh, like yeah. almost kind of janky but in an endearing way. Like I like how it is. I dude, it, it caught me so off guard that they're doing this whole song and dance, and he's like such a noble person, and the merry men are breaking out, mm-hmm. and then it kind of turns into oh, they're they're doing this for show, yeah, as opposed to being like very noble, oh, right? You <laughs> <They're> know, <laughs> selfish reasons, <laughs> exactly. And then she just comes in there and beats all of them down. They did a similar joke to the Duloc singing puppets thing, where they said something about like him wanting to be laid, essentially. Like, that's all he wants to get. But they, they rhymed it with something else, but it made you think that that's what they were going oh, to say. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I just... <laughs> oh, dude, this, uh, they, they there's so a many, lot of fun. <laughs> there's a lot of, like, kind of jokes that would go over kids' heads, I think, in this movie. A like, lot. There's so much of it. Like, I you think he's overcompensating for something. Like, kids aren't going to know what that means. No, <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It's not cat in the hat. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> also, Mike Myers yeah there's the link um but i i i think uh uh i do like the one criticism i guess i would have like the one big one is uh the animation it is kind of dated like it's That's, yeah it does not s- hold up as well <laughs> i think it's visually <laughs> i i th- i think it does i mean i don't oh yeah well so I'm not like too picky, but like I mean, you know, you I think you you like you play video games and you do I think like a lot more with entertainment and like in the animated you know like stuff. Like I don't like, dude. I you I play like the MLB the show. Mm-hmm. Like they are gonna get to a point where it's like it, they have the lines of a 35 year old guy in a video game and then like a smoother face for a 23 year old. Like you're gonna be looking and be like, oh shit, mm-hmm. you know. So I think like. It does like it, we are seeing more of it, and the more that you see it as it advances, you probably can your catalog like the years, you know, and be like, oh, that was another great step. Yeah. Um. But see, like, I don't have it, so like I'm watching this, and I'm it still reminds me of just being like, um, you know, young. But it, like I, 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 if you told me that if I hadn't seen this movie and you're like, this came out eight years ago, mm-hmm. I would believe you with what I know of animation. Mm-hmm. So like, I don't think it's too bad and that's why i was saying i think it will hold up in another 20 years unless that catches up to it yeah because then you will feel more of that like uh um bubbly rounded you know like kind of weird line segments going on with connected at dots or however it works out with what those nerds fucking do yeah i'm sure at the time it was pretty impressive especially considering this movie came out 2001 like I think it was r- supposed to rival Pixar because I mean, you, like Toy Story one and two had both been out, mm-hmm. and I think like Nemo just came out. Mm, Nemo was two thousand three, I think. What was before? Did so there was Bugs Life that came out, I think, after Toy Story, but before Toy Story two, and then was it? Uh, I can't remember exactly. I know Incredibles was after it. Was Monsters Inc. two thousand one? Yeah, that was it. I think it was Monsters Inc. So like, if you think about Monsters Inc. and Shrek both coming out at the same time, I feel like they're both kind of on the same plane. Yeah, you know, I'll have to rewatch Monsters Inc. It's been so long since I've seen it, but oh. I, I I remember loving that movie as a child. Oh, it's a fucking top. Come on, yeah. Come come on, come, now. come on, come on. Hey, I'm walking here. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm trying to see a movie. Um, <clears throat> yeah. There's another um. There's another kind of criticism I wanted to bring up really? that I had. Um, yeah, this can't be all good. Listen, I gotta, I gotta Disney fucking lovers. I gotta fucking put yeah. the line in the sand somewhere. Yeah, 
So I, it kind of bugs me in movies when there's conflict that only arises because characters just don't know how to communicate with each other. What's wrong with that? That's everyday life. It, true, but like, I mean, <laughs> I don't like thinking about everyday life. That's oh, why right. I watch movies to right. escape my everyday yeah, life. Yeah, what the fuck McLean. are these guys doing? Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, you get what I'm saying in that, like, two characters have you a misunderstanding. Give me well, like when um, when Donkey is talking to Fiona. And Shrek walks up. And Shrek walks up, yeah, and he only th- hears like that it's part. It's such a cop-out. Yes. Yes. That's, that's exactly what no, I mean. That's, and I'm with you on that. Okay. I, it does, it's not enough to take me away from it, but I was watching it again, and I was like, why do they do that thing where like a guy walks in halfway through a conversation, collects one piece, walks out, and then somehow the two people that are kind of falling in love or working together or... Or trying to find the treasure, like you, you know, I, I heard everything I said. He said it's time to go south, and it's like, well, yeah, we have to. It's like I think this is going very yeah. south then, and it's like, well, where else do you want to go? It's like psh, anywhere besides with you. Yeah, and exactly. You're like, and there's like total miscommunication because they at like don't know at all what each other's talking about. Yeah, and it's I don't. It, I think I needed a little bit more than just like hearing that and even exactly if you, when you listen to it again if you listen to her what she says doesn't make sense in terms of because she goes how could something so beautiful so unless she's calling shrek's incredibly beautiful which you don't really hear girls say that about the guys <laughs> yeah. you know handsome charming loving and dear i thought you were gonna say you don't hear the girls talk say that about shrek oh because <laughs> <laughs> you definitely do I will say. Yeah. I know I did. Full size body pillow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amazon search history. Yeah. Delete. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm glad you said that because that is that was one thing where I was like, I'm, I'm watching it and I think I was making breakfast and I, 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 I wanted to hear that part again because I was like, I don't always remember how this got brought up, but I know that they had like the, it's the same thing in the superhero movies where it's like, he wanted to be caught. Fuck. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's like, there's got to be a better answer. It was answer a trap. Than, yeah, than that. He, he was one step ahead all along. He trapped us with a trap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he trapped our trap. Yeah. yeah. And then along those same lines, I think the ending is not as climactic as it could have been. Like, I think it's pretty, like, it kind of goes by a little quick for me. Like, I don't think there's as much there as there potentially could have been in terms of, like, making it feel impactful. Like, they do resolve it, and, like, yeah, everything wraps up, but it, I don't know. It just kind of comes and goes. They really did it a lot quicker. It, you, yeah. These are two good points, because, I mean, they, they did it do a lot quicker than what I remember. Mm-hmm. I remember the dragon coming in and eating Farquaad and doing it, but I thought there was, like, a huge fight, and she started fighting. Like, I, for some reason, all of a sudden, it was just like, yeah. Yeah, like, the dragon comes in, eats Farquaad, and then, then that's that. Mm-hmm. Like, that it's really movies kind of, done <laughs> yeah well it's more so in terms of finding you know true loves the climax is the kiss it's not the yeah you know, stop. i mean that's kind of the last little bit of L- little nugget of fun there yeah mm-hmm. but i mean i'm gonna tell you right now for fucking 94 minutes like this is about as clean as you can get yeah it, it doesn't waste any time have you ever watched um shrek retold no do you know what that is? Nope. You know, it's a um. So every year there is a there's a festival. It's called Shrek Fest, and people get together and they they celebrate Shrek. What they did one year is they did this thing called Shrek Retold, where they took a bunch of different artists and writers and actors and like YouTube creators or whatever, and they either animated or acted out a thirty second segment from Shrek. Mm. And like they were each assigned like their own segment and they recreated them and they stitched them all together. And they basically have the entire movie where like every 30 seconds, it changes from different art styles and like different right. But it goes of, through the, film? but it goes through the whole story of it. Wow. And it's on YouTube. You can watch it. If really? you look up Shrek retold. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. It's fun. Cause there'll be moments where it like is live action and just some guys in like shitty costumes, but then it goes into like a really good animated, like fight sequence. Yeah. It's really fascinating. If you want to check it out, just look up Shrek retold on YouTube. Because it's fun. It's funny. I think I'm going to have to. Yeah. Well, I'm actually more curious about Shrek Fest. 
You know where that's at? I don't know where that's at. All right, question. Mm. If we went to Shrek Fest, do we blend in? Um, I would have to look up pictures of it. I would have to know what I'm getting into. But just by default, knowing what I look like, yes. <laughs> I'm not even thinking about like, it's like I say the look, but you know, like, you know, and you walk up and you can smell an outsider. Mm-hmm. Like, do we get peppered with like four oh, different questions? Like, like right? we haven't been to Shrek Fest before, but all these people have been like the last five years. Yeah, but it's not big enough to where it's like anyone, you know, there's only like 300 people, but they all kind of know each other in yeah, some light. Yeah. So, like, we show up and it's obviously public, but like we could go in there and we bring a potluck. And mm-hmm. it's like, do we get peppered with four questions mm-hmm. and automatically, like, you know, like, do we get shrekt out of there? Yeah, like, people turn their back to us. Like, we can't go into like in certain cliques. Oh yeah, you know? we're our own like weird kind of outside documentary crew almost. Oh, we should. That's it. That's how we break the bank. Shrek fest. Shrek fest. We document Shrek fest. Yeah, let's do GoPros. Yes, but we'll make. We'll do. We'll <laughs> very make, inconspicuous. Oh, we'll do the far quad paper mache things. There you go. Yeah. Then we'll hide them that way. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. We have a plan. It'll be great. <laughs> We'll until, have to find out when and where that until is. So after 30 minutes in the filming, like everyone turns their back to us. Yeah. You know, it's like when you walk up to the group and they're like, oh, yeah, if you just go that way, it's like, well, what are you guys up to? It's like nothing. Yeah. And they like turn their backs and it's like, then you sit there awkwardly and it's like, where do we go to now? Hello, fellow Shrekker. We are just here enjoying <laughs> ourselves. What are you doing in my swamp, eh? Yeah. I feel like it's the not a cop gig. <laughs> <laughs> You wearing a GoPro? No, you can search me. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's when I run away and then I run into something and fall down just like the guy did. Oh, yeah, <laughs> just like the big mascot? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. We, we've we got a plan. There it is. Um, Do we have any more thoughts about Shrek before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't really. I mean, it's like I said, I mean, they're, they're, all three of these films, very hard to, like, just pull out. I mean, there's, you know. Yeah, especially this one, dude. So clean. So I mean, it's how how can you not? True. How can you not? Uh, what would you rate it? Um, you know, I I think a nine out of ten. Okay. I might have my IMDb saw an eight out of ten. I think this is a definitely a nine. Okay, this is a solid eight for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, pretty comfortable with that. I would not say if it's close to a seven or a nine. It's pretty comfortably eight. Yep. For me personally. Really like this film. Um speaking of Shrek, we've got more Shrek to yeah. talk about. I'm of course talking about Shrek two, baby. Let me get some Is info that what on this. Called? Uh it's not called Shrek Two Baby. Oh. It's just called Shrek Two. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so um this film, uh, I can cover this one since you got the first one, uh, came out 2004, uh, DreamWorks, obviously, directed by Andrew Adamson, Kelly Asbury, and Conrad Vernon, uh, and uh, based off Shrek by William Stieg. All the same cast, pretty much, in addition to Julie Andrews, Antonio Banderas, John Cleese, Rupert Everett, and Jennifer Saunders. Follows Shrek and Fiona after the events of the first movie. They get married. They go on their honeymoon. They come back to the swamp to find that Donkey's there. And they're like, Donkey, we need some alone time. We just got married. But then he says, what about these guys? And so they get an announcement that the king and queen, the the mother and father of Fiona, request that they, they see them because they heard that Fiona got married. And so they arrive in far, far away to meet Fiona's parents and... Uh, they find out that their daughter's an ogre and married to an ogre. So they are in for a surprise and hijinks ensue situations arise. And, uh, with the fairy godmother and Prince charming meddling their fingers into everything. Yes. So there you have it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say this right now just to, just to get the bandage off. Oh, I think Shrek two is better than Shrek one. Wow. Yep. Really? Mm hmm. I do. I really do. I think Shrek 2 overall is a better movie than Shrek 1. I can't go to Shrek Fest with you. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I can't be seen next to you at Shrek Fest. Oh my Fest. god, no! I'm gonna be like, what, I'm. Gonna, they're gonna take the guy with the giant paper mache for a fucking head over you when we get there. Oh, I don't know. I'll be. You might find that sh- more people are on my side here. No, I would. Oh, I know they are, and I know it. This is it's so despicable. <laughs> How dare I? Well, I. This was a good. I. It's so bizarre. Jasmine said the same thing. I was like, I yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't. I, I like. I, one to me is a lot cleaner. Mm. See, I think overall two is a better film. I think it's more engaging because there's more shit in there for people. But I don't. I don't know. I'm I think not, it just feels like a more compelling movie in terms of like plot and characters overall. Really? I think so. Like to me, I think it's better paced also because watching the first one, I was kind of like going in and out. Like I was enjoying it, but I was a lot of the time kind of wondering like all right i've seen like and i don't know if it's a product of me seeing it a bunch but i was just wondering like okay when's this gonna like kind of get along like when am i gonna get to the next movie and then the next movie comes which i feel like i've seen an equal amount are you of. trying to cause conflict right now in this show i mean if it just naturally occurs then <laughs> <laughs> but watching the second one i really didn't feel that way at all how I many was, times have you seen it i can't tell you it's okay. been too many that's not and i noticed how you said two in there not true okay well <laughs> not too many but i've seen it more times than i can remember how about that really yeah i'd probably say so i i can only estimate like i can probably estimate that i've seen each film at least <sighs> probably 10 times not enough to go to shrek fest all right mm, okay. um <laughs> yeah don't, I don't you know, gatekeep so- shrek fest for me sir i <laughs> We'll do it. Yes. I'd much rather go to Shrek Fest than go to Cannes or Cannes. Cannes Film Festival? Yeah. I'd like to go... Well, Shrek Fest would probably just be more fun. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. Uh, Cannes would be, I think, more interesting to me personally, but I get what you mean. Yeah. Um. No, I don't... So you're going on. I mean, you got... I didn't yes. mean to cut you off. No, no, you're good. I just... I. To summarize my thoughts on why I think it's better... I think the animation's better. I think the story's more compelling. I think the characters are better. And I think the overall tone of the movie is just really consistent. Not that it's not consistent in the first one, but I think it maintains I think it that matches level. Tone. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm not saying it's better than the first, but I think it matches it and that sort of adds to right. like my favorability of the movie. Cause I keep in mind, I like the first Shrek movie. Like, I gave I it an 8 out of 10, but I think this one, for me personally, just overall enjoyment, like, the characters, I just, I don't know, I found it really, like, more well-rounded. And I think it's more climactic, too, than the first one. I guess. Mm. I, I, I <laughs> in terms of a sequel, yes, this is probably one of the best sequels you'll see. Oh, absolutely. And, like, you know, like, Godfather 2 territory, mm. you know? I have yet to see those movies. Excuse me? Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Shrek Fest. Anyway, when are we making uh, plans? <laughs> I'll buy the tickets now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kyle. So, well, okay. I want to hear your thoughts then. Why do you think Shrek 1 is better than Shrek 2? I Okay. So watching Shrek 2, it feels like there's more uh, stimulus, stimuli in this film. Mm-hmm. More... Uh, fattier portions of the burger, if you will. Uh, the characters are certainly engaging, but I also feel like they're turning into a little bit more of caricatures than they are like characters with depth. The the king essentially is making sure that now I, I shouldn't say it like that. Queens here here nor there, right? The king probably goes through a little bit of an arc, and you get to see. It. He, oh yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, Shrek. You just continue his love for Fiona, you know. I don't know if there's any sort of respect that he... I mean, he obviously earns it from the king, but doesn't do anything to earn it. Besides, you know, fight for Fiona, yeah. which he does in the first one. You know, Donkey, to me, was like a little... He was more overzealous in this thing. I didn't really care for the Puss in Boots versus Donkey match. Now, they did have like... It was a little fun. That is kind of... That's like one thing about the movie that I agree with you on with like the puss in boots donkey rivalry yeah it was kind of like unneeded yes i like i think there are certain things in this thing that were unneeded but they had 
So I was telling Jasmine about this because she she likes Shrek two more than Shrek one. Mm-hmm. And I had the same exact reaction, <laughs> uh, appalled and aghast. Yeah. Uh, How abhorrent. <laughs> I don't want to go that far because that makes me think of freaking uh, Ted Bundy. Or no, who's the guy that? Oh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. You know nothing weird, just artsy stuff. Just artsy stuff. You know, we're just gonna hang out, pay fifty bucks, we'll watch Shrek two. We'll watch Shrek two and then you can leave. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so um but anyway yeah but it, but anyway but anyway um i thought i thought what happened with the first one was they realized how much of a gold mine the fairy the, the minor fairy tale creatures were the pinocchios the gingerbread man the muffin man all you know the three little pigs red you know Red Red Robin, Red Riding <laughs> Red Robin, the burger place. What the fuck is Red Riding Hood? Yeah, Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Such a weird name. I know. Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah. And that's not even her name. That's just what she's wearing. Yeah. <laughs> Identity based off clothing and their appearance. Yeah. <laughs> a general a general confu a gender confused wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are some there's quips in here that are really fun. But I it, so my point being is I did I didn't think this was as clean. I felt like it was a little bit more dialed back in terms of mm. plot and they added more of the fun stuff in there that they didn't you couldn't capitalize on the first one. And that's what usually what sequels do, but a lot of times sequels will go over the edge and fucking put way too much of that in there lose base of the characters that got him there you mm. know and like donkey felt like he wasn't he just seems like way over the top donkey and then shrek i mean it was he felt kind of i mean shrek like you know and i don't know if it was him like going through some sort of like i'm starting to understand more of the world that i'm getting outside of you know my swamp well, so, i think his whole arc in this movie is specifically like what he would change for Fiona and like what if anything about himself he would change like the first movie was him sort of like accepting who he was um and like ho- like showing other people who he was and hopefully like getting them to like attach themselves to him because he is he is who he is he's mm-hmm. a good good personality good guy this movie is about like what about him as a personality and like who he is as like an ogre he would change and not just like his appearance, but also just like what he is on the inside. And that's kind of like the point of it. Kind Did of, he really change anything on the inside? He changed everything on the outside. Well, he kind of, he showed the lengths of like how far he would go to, to be with Fiona and like to do the things that he wanted to do. I mean, he went out into the forest to hopefully mend things with her dad, which I mean, obviously like started the plot of the movie. He went to fairy godmother, changed his whole appearance, did that for her. And it wasn't even his appearance that Fiona was really attached to towards the end. It's the fact that he was willing to do all those things for her that she admired and loved. And yeah, he, you know, she told him that like, you can look like this, you can look like an ogre. It doesn't matter. I still love you. Like it wasn't like his appearance that drew her towards him again or like reaffirmed their love. It was the fact that he was willing to go that far for it. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't buy. I never get into that. Like it's. I mean, dude, you're you're gonna marry. I don't know. And that's the thing too, because I'm completely different. I throw myself into all this shit, so I'm mm. like sitting there watching and projecting. I'm like, well, how you know? Yeah, you're obviously gonna have to do what you have to do. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, if you got it, you got to make amends, or you got to talk, and you got to go out. I mean, it's. Yeah, and he has moments of doubt, too, like he does in the first one. Like, he keeps saying to himself, like, I should have stayed in the swamp. Like, I shouldn't have come here. We shouldn't be here. Like, he, he's, like, almost on the verge of, like, leaving the, like, whole, time the whole time. Yeah. And so he kind of has to, like, fight with himself in order to determine, okay, I do want to go do this for Fiona. Like, I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this for her because I want her to be happy. I mean, he goes through the diary and feels shitty because he sees Mrs. Fiona Charming over and over again. And he wishes that he could be that. And so he wants to go through that in order for her to be happy with him. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's his arc in the movie. And I think it's pretty consistent with it what is. his arc was in the first one too. That's what I'm saying. It's mm. yes. yes. I think we're agreeing, <laughs> but we're not knowing that we're agreeing. No, we are. I'm just saying it's not as good as the, the first one is the original and it sets the pace for everything else. So like if you're talking about something that gets, created firstly you have to outdo i don't i guess what i'm saying it, everything is to me the exact same except they they put in more um fun they try to but it's still it i don't know it feels like i don't know 
I, I don't know if I want to say it feels more like an adventure to me, but I, ju- I guess it just feels it more. Could, it probably does. Because, I mean, in the first one, all they do is go through the woods. I mean, in this one, he goes through, like. Yeah, he goes through, like, a woods, transformation. And then he's got the fairy godmother. And then he's got to get, you know, they, they, he, he, he's got to get back. And then yeah, he gets, gets kicked out of the castle. He creates the big uh, fucking uh, gingerbread man, goes back, has the assault on the castle. Like, there's a whole thing that just. I don't know. It just feels more, I guess, impactful to me. Like the first one is very just A to B, go here, go there with this stuff in between. This one, it feels like it zigzags. He meets new characters. They get in new situations. And I don't know. It just feels more fresh to me. I I guess that's the good word that I would use is fresh. I'm not even going to. It's I. I. Yes. Okay. I don't see when Jasmine told me it to. I'm like, I don't, I couldn't disagree. This is actually a sequel. Like I said, most sequels really suck. Oh yeah, or they're really bad. Like I was, I was Shrek I, the Third. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to clear my throat. Yeah, that one is. I mean, it's not terrible. I saw it once, which if that tells you anything about Stilskin, right? How I feel about him, I think. Yeah, I don't remember if that's the third or the. Is there a fourth? There is a fourth one. Shrek Forever After. Which I haven't seen. That might be admittedly. Skin. I think that might be. Anyways. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I I, 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 I I can see it. And I, I'm not disputing it. I guess it's mm. when you kind of... You know, the things with these movies is you kind of see through where it's going, how it's going to end up, you know? Yeah. And it's really enjoying how it gets there. And I think maybe it's because they're falling in love for the first time is why I like the first one a little bit more. And it's always I can see a that. story that I can get behind because that's how it usually works, you know. And maybe yeah. because I saw it at a young age when there was a lot of conflict with girls at that time trying to get them, you know, and people battling emotions. And then you share some commonality over a certain event and, you know, it creates a bond. Hmm. Whereas this one, there is really no bond. I guess you would like, like you said, it's his change and what he's the lengths he's willing to go yeah. after they've already created that bond. So that's a little. It's more on me what viewing it with everything else going around, mm. and with everything else going around, I don't. I, I tr- yeah, his he has character growth, but it never. I don't know. It doesn't feel like he's growing. Like he's accepting. Yeah, you know. So. I just really like the jokes in this movie too. Like I just think it's really funny. It is. This I I'm, I can't like yes. Like this movie's good. It, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I think that uh, my favorite is when they're getting arrested and they have the cops footage and they're like using the pepper spray, oh, like the, sh- yeah. the salt, like the pepper shaker as the pepper spray, and they arrest puts and boots and he's like, catnip. Uh, that's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't wonder- know. I really, I really like those moments where it's just really silly and yeah. funny. Like the intro, there's like so many references that they pack in the intro. That's kind of like purposefully self-aware i would say like mm-hmm. with the spider-man kiss hanging upside down and the fucking one ring falling on her finger like lord of the rings like yeah i don't know i just i thought it was appropriately tongue-in-cheek yeah they're taking more of what's going on pop culturally and implant it and uh, putting it into the film right sort yeah. of like taking that concept of making fun of disney but sort of bringing it to i don't know a bigger scale in a way so I don't even know if it's making fun. I mean, it's just kind of being self-aware that it's a movie and that there's other things going around that people would recognize. Yeah, that's like true. in the first one, they use the Matrix. Mm-hmm. You know, the Matrix there, kick. Whoosh. There might be a couple other things in there that you know, maybe sevens in there somehow. I don't uh, know. Alien for sure. When Puss in Boots bursts out of his shirt. Oh really? Yeah. Well, like when he's when he gets into his shirt and he's like crawling around, and all of a sudden he like bursts out from the front. Yeah. He's just like sticking out like the <laughs> alien. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot to pick apart in this movie, and I think that's also part of like why I really enjoy it. There's, I don't know. There's plenty, and they they pull in a lot of more um, real world effects into this. You're not just walking through the woods. Yeah, far far away land. They're just kind of making fun of culture. Like old it's neighbor-y. obviously supposed to be Hollywood. Like yes. they've got old. They got Burger King, Fat Boy Friars, yeah. or like whatever is supposed to be Big Boy. Yeah, uh, Far Bucks or whatever they call it. <laughs> they run out of the Far Bucks and go into another one across the street. <laughs> I don't know. That joke always makes me laugh. But could, yeah, I don't know. I, I just I don't know. I I really like this overall. Like I just I I'm like not it. Disputing better. it. Yeah. This one. All right. So I'll say this one's more fun. I think the first one's more endearing to me. 
I got you. Yeah. I can I can understand that. I think that. that's maybe where my old man Matt kind of kicks in. Oh, you're not old, you know? You're like uh you're like an older brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Older, not old. Right. I would not call you an old brother. Not yet anyway. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I think uh what well let's talk about the characters. So like you said you're not that big into puss in boots. I thought he was fu- I mean so when I, all right, Eddie Murphy in this thing went way over the top, and I think it's just because it's hey, you're friends with Shrek, so it's like how much more of a friend do I make than I did in the first one? I don't think it's like dialogue was all there, and then he creates the rivalry with Puss in Boots. Puss in Boots was kind of funny, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I thought Antonio Banderas was good, you know. I, I think ne- it was a solid addition to like their gang of characters. Yeah, I mean, and he gave me a little bit of a. Um, princess bride vibe oh yeah for you know, sure like he pulled kind of like zorro princess bride like yeah make like poking fun at that concept yes yeah and uh you know so i and they like i said their stuff like shrek was all right he felt like a little neutered in this mm. um was that a cat pun could have been. <laughs> holy shit <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh fiona was fiona you know rupert everett which is from my best friend's wedding. Um, I liked him. It's mm. Prince Charming. Prince Charming. Yeah, I liked him, and I really like Fairy Godmother. I think they're good villains. They were fantastic. I mean, they were they were fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, and and what they had going on, and Shrek going in there as a union rep. Oh yeah, that's always so. Funny. <laughs> we were talking about that at work today. Really? When I brought up Shrek One and Shrek Two. Oh like, my just, god. The, we're with the union. Yeah. I, we don't even have dental. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just go in here then. Yeah, we're just going to take a look around and uh, best if the boss doesn't find out. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of my favorites is when they like they kidnap the guy, take his clothes, and then Shrek just has it over his oh, head. Yeah. And he's fucking bumbling through. Yeah, he's <laughs> working dead. hard or hardly working. <laughs> that guy's name was Mac. Oh, I think yeah, I think I remember no, that. Wa- like I was I just watched I was like, "Oh shit. How you doing, Mac?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wild. I can't believe you made it into the movie. That's crazy. Well, I was like, oh, man, maybe someone subconsciously, everyone voted on this just to, you know, because Max in it. Yeah. Dude, we're going to make it into Shrek Fest no problem now. Oh, my God, yes. You're, you're, just, you're just that guy. Yeah, I am that guy. They're going to have the pitchforks, but as soon as you say, hey, I'm Mac, they're going to be like, oh, it's going to be like that scene where human Shrek rides on the horse and they have the pitchforks, but then they just wave at him. <laughs> it's going to be like that. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to make it in the clicks. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe we'll do uh, Shrek. What is it called? Oh, Shrek Retold. Shrek Retold. They are doing Shrek Retold too. That's what I'm saying. We might have to make a pitch. We might be too late. I don't know if they already made it all already or like recorded it. They haven't released it yet, mm. but they're doing it. That I know they're for sure. They're doing it. Them, that's a great quote. They're um, doing it. <laughs> Appropriate for the Shrek franchise. Yes. <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, yeah, the villains are great. Um, the music. We haven't even talked about the music for either movie. Solid soundtrack. Like, oh, yeah. great, great music. Like, great selection of music. Just really so, appropriate. The All-Star Smash Mouth mm. placeholder song. Oh, yeah. They didn't even have... Well, I'm saying they didn't even... They, were, they had it in there oh. when they did the, the, the like editing or the viewing. Oh, they for, just stuck it in like, hey, we'll just put this in place of something else. To, to find something else. They never did. And it was such a hit when they... Re- well, I, I shouldn't say it like that. I think they did, but it was such a hit with the audience mm. when they first did it that they put it back. And because it had so much success, that's why they gave them the ending song, like, I'm a believer. Oh, yeah. Like, that's why they gave it to Smash Mouth. That's funny. Yeah. That's awesome. Like a lot of this stuff just lucked out. Mm-hmm. And then, but I, you know, in the second one, I don't remember too much of the tunes. But it, it's kind of similar. I don't think there's any Smash Mouth from what I remember, but it's like accidentally have, in love. Yes. I need a hero is the biggest one, I think. Oh, sung by uh, Jennifer Saunders? Yeah. yeah. I need a hero. Yep. I, I think that, like, in this movie is the most iconic song to me. I don't, yeah. I maybe. During yeah. that whole like climactic scene, where accidentally he's into the in castle. love. Is that the Counting Crows? I don't know. I'm not as much into music as I am movies, sadly. Mm. So I could not tell you. But who did? Uh, I'm gonna say yes. Paved parking lot. 
Pave Paradise, put yeah. up a parking lot. Ooh, I think pop, it was the pop, same pop. band that did Accidentally in Love. <laughs> nope. Could be. Just Smash Mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Just Smash Mouth. Um, yeah, no. Uh, excellent movie. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about this? About this one? About Shrek 2? No. Well, have you seen... So, let's talk about the sequels a bit, because okay. I don't know if... So, I've seen Shrek the third one time. I don't know. Is that... Does he have kids in that? Well, so, you say I think. That- I think he finds out that Fiona's pregnant in it, and then he goes off and he finds. I mean, spoilers for Shrek the Third too, in case you were no, wondering. just Shrek the Third. <laughs> Shrek the Third Two, the sequel. <laughs> Shrek, Shrek the Third Two, Forever After. Yes. Um, <laughs> sequels for all Shrek. Don't do this at Shrek Fest, please. No, um, you will you will die. You will get pitchforked. Oh the my throat. god! What if it turned into like Midsommar? Oh. Like, we're just there, and all of a sudden, they're heaving me off a cliff. Yeah, we're on the set of an A24 documentary. <laughs> hey, um, everyone, take a glass of the Kool-Aid. Yeah. But um, I, well, should we go into our ratings first of Shrek 2 before we kind of get into the others? Kind uh, of? Do we have to get too far into the others? Like, you don't even remember the third or the fourth one, and I think I've seen the fourth one. but I haven't not... seen the fourth one at all. Yeah, there we go. That's what I'm saying. Like, we can do this one real quick. Well, okay. all right. No, how about... Th- all right. Uh, no, let's, let's do this, and then we'll wrap it up with the rating of Shrek 2. Okay. Yeah, Shrek the third, I saw one time, okay. and I the only thing I remember is that the king dies because he's a frog and he's got like the lifespan of a frog so then he croaks and then shrek (laughs) shrek is shrek is named king but he doesn't want to be king oh and so he has to go out and find king arthur and he finds him in like this high school setting and he's voiced by justin uh fucking what's his name jt justin timberlake Oh, that's right. I remember reading that in the second one. Which is funny because Fiona has a poster of Justin Timberlake above her bed. Yeah, and then they they didn't do it. They started dating like incidentally, like with that movie coinciding with the movie coming out. So I think they cast them then as like Cameron Diaz and Justin Timberlake. Yeah, they started dating when the movie got released. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, so it, like coincided, <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't do it to do that, you know. So, oh, it so, was it just happenstance. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So then it was, yeah, it was it serendipitous. Yeah. Uh, so Organic. then they, huh? Uh, nothing. I'm just adding oh. adjectives. Yeah, I. <laughs> uh, in the third one, I think they cast them at for that reason. Then okay, it was like, hey, they're dating, and then we have them in here. Wouldn't that be funny? I just fucking self-aware Shrek. Yeah. I just, I, I remember not enjoying it nearly as much as the first two. Like I just wasn't as a, excuse me. Yeah. I just wasn't as attached to the characters or the story or anything. Like, I don't know. Like as a kid, I saw it once. And the fact that I haven't been back to revisit it, I feel like says a lot. Yeah. Oh, it did come out, you know, the two, the third and the fourth one kind of came out At points where it wasn't like cool with Shrek, it was kind of yeah, it was kind of like come and go. Like I don't know, the actors weren't as relevant. Like the the story of Shrek, it felt like it had already been told. Like what more could they do with it? Like, right. Let's add the family to it. Yeah. The fourth one, I'm not gonna lie. Like I think the fourth one isn't bad. Right? I haven't seen the fourth one. I've heard that it's better than the third. I think so. I dude, if I had to guess, they like fucked up the third so bad. They're like, let's get a fourth one in here just to kind of like, mm. let's get it right, you know, yeah. so we don't end it on that. They bring Rumpelstiltskin in, and Shrek is just tired of his family, mm-hmm. and Rumpelstiltskin's like down on his luck, and he needs to like, you know, get a wish. So I don't even know if he's king, but it turns like it's like a midlife crisis for Shrek. Yeah. And he loses an appreciation for his family. Yeah, that's kind of what I heard that it's about. It's like he wants to go back to his old life in a way yes. and like he he misses the good old days of like just being at the swamp. Well, and just being, you know, uh, not having any responsibilities and being independent. Yeah. I also heard too that um the well, I I didn't hear it. I've seen the clip. It's like the do the roar. That's what I. It's like from that movie, like the kid that goes up to him and is like, "Do the roar." Yeah. He like wants Shrek to do the famous Shrek roar or yeah. whatever. Like, yeah. Then he finally does it, and or whatever causes a scene. 
causes like, the kids to start crying. They're at like a Chuck E. Cheese, but it's whatever. Oh, yeah. It's Chuck E. Cheese in whatever universe that is. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, that's a, that's essentially it. I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know if I watched it. I saw the fourth one because it was part of a, yeah, I'm glad that you're seeing this. Mm. Oh, the mic. <laughs> yeah, your fidget thing is finally. You should have talked about it. I know. I, I I cursed it. I was. Yeah. I was doing so well, and I, I, was, yeah, I literally looked over there and I started sliding down. That's why. Well, I was, I was wondering, like, because the mic kind of sounded weird in my ear. I was like, "What's mm. going on here?" But I think I've realized what it is now. So. But yeah, uh, uh, I I think Shrek Four is probably way better than Shrek Three, and I've never seen Shrek Three. Mm. Possible future revisit. Yeah, in two weeks. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have no control over that whatsoever. That's what I'm talking about. Bleed it. <laughs> um. So yeah, was there anything you else you wanted to touch no, on? No, that's good. We're good. Shre- okay. We got. We just shreked it. Shreked it the f out. I think I gave my rating for Shrek one first, so you can give your rating for Shrek two first. Uh, I'm gonna give this one a. This is an eight out of ten for me. I'm giving this one a 9 out of 10. Yeah, I thought I saw that coming. Mm, yep. I actually... So, I... Mac, when I first watched these movies, like, before I, I turned them on, because I watched them... I watched first one one day, and then the second one the next day. So, mm-hmm. they were pretty close in proximity. Right. I had them both scored the same. I had them both an 8 out of 10. Wow. I watched them both, one after another, pretty much. I felt, I felt very strongly enough about it to raise Shrek 2 by a point. So, like, I, I I feel confident in in that nine out of ten. That's uh, I think a lot of the younger audience would relate to that. I think some of the older mm. audience may relate to Shrek One being actually probably not. I'll probably just die in the cell. Maybe we'll have a poll on Facebook and YouTube. Who knows? Yeah, put up your age and your what you rate them. <laughs> put up, but have you been to Shrek Fest? Yes or no? <laughs> yeah. That's what I want to know. I think we should get across. I'm telling you, dude. You know what would be even funnier than us documenting Shrek Fest? Mm. Making a movie about two guys going to Shrek Fest, but it's about... It's a horror it's movie. It's a cult sacrifice with LSD it's, and just like... It's Midsummer. Yeah. I'm. How hard would you be laughing thinking about like... Getting taken out, but you're high as fuck by a, sh- a Shrek. Like yeah. a guy dressed as... It'd be horrifying. A guy a, dressed as the executioner from the first one. Oh, my God. Dude who's the, Lord Farquaad, of, who's like four foot tall. Yeah, but he like... Oh, my God. Yeah. He's got the big head. That'd be terrifying. If I'm a, telling you. If a big-headed Lord Farquaad came at me and was actually four foot tall... I'd be freaking out. Yeah, expect and like you uncanny. don't even know what you drank. You're just like on something, and you're like, mm. "This is way too trippy just, for me." Here, have some ogre juice. And yeah. it's fucking LSD. That's what and I'm saying. Mushrooms but, you know, grind it up in it. Yeah, you, the whole time we're just there, thinking it's gonna be like a great time. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it's then, really like, oh, and then they do the deaths that we saw, like so, like two people get turned into like balloons yeah <laughs> well actually what they do is they like suck out everything and then they turn you into skin you get embalmed basically yeah but yeah. in a really like horrifying way so, oh my god not that it's not horrifying Combustion. anyway yeah. yeah yeah that'd be wild that would be wild that hey, would be a- that would be wild thornberries uh the guy that interned at A24, we got a script for you. Yeah. <laughs> Can you submit this to your higher-ups, please? Yeah. Clip- I know you're, you're not there anymore, but just, you know, you have connections. Was that an A24 film? What? Midsummer? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We got... Dude, we're in, like, Flint. Exactly. We know what we're talking about. We literally just take the script and just cross out anything where it says cult members and put Shrek. <laughs> Fucking Florence Pugh's character is replaced just with Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> No, that'd be us. Oh, yeah. You know? So we're Florence Pugh and uh, her boyfriend in the movie. Yeah. 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 Except, I I mean, obviously one of us has to be Florence Pugh. Anyway, let's not get into spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get into spoilers. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, good good discussion on the Shrek movies. And, uh, sp- and how we're going to make Shrek 5. Yes. Speaking of 5... Five minus four is one, and we got one question that we can one answer. Is the magic number one? Is the loneliest number oh, that man. you'll ever do? I think we went two different ways with that song. Yeah, I went a little more depressive. You went a little more optimistic. <laughs> but you know what? We play off each other really well. Anyway, exactly. 
our question comes from Bren on our YouTube community page, which I was very pleasantly surprised to see a question posted there. So thank you, Bren. Um, <clears throat> his question is, with 2022 coming to an end, what were your guys' favorite albums of the year and why? That's the face I made when I read it because I don't... <laughs> I'm sorry to say, Bren, but I'm not a big like new music listener, so I really haven't listened to much that has come out this year. But really? I mean, can yeah. it be new to us, or does it have to be new to the it year? It can be. It can be. Let's just say it's new to us because I think new to is the year. Bren or Ben? It's Bren. B R E N N. Oh. Yeah, it was from YouTube, so they can have like whatever name they want. Hey, but I mean, this guy's a person. Yeah. This guy's a human <laughs> being. <laughs> Unless he got an AI to write this question, I don't know. Oh, that'd be wild. Yeah. Or the super hipster. Uh, exactly. Um but no, I just I I think um in terms of like just overall music I've been listening to because I think that's the only way I can kind of answer a question like this mm-hmm. is I've just been listening to a lot of the same stuff I usually listen to. So my favorite band being Have a Nice Life which is very kind of post-punk, industrial, shoegazy. Like, they have very long songs. I think their shortest song is three three minutes and 48 seconds with Future. And then their longest song is Destinos from their uh, Sea of Worry album, uh, which is at 13 minutes. Um, but no, that's my favorite band. I still listen to them. I listen to them constantly. Not many people know about them, and I think more people should because I love them. You just, t- yeah. I just, I promoted them, essentially. Nice. There you go. There you go, Dan Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> um, you brand. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, in terms of other music, too, because um, it's not all that I listen to, but, um, you know, some MGMT. I've been listening to, um, like, kind of just relaxing jazz piano really? as I drive. Yeah, just kind of, well, because some of it almost feels like it could be, like, background Christmas music. Yeah, and so driving it through the snow and like the winter time, it, there's just something kind of relaxing about it, especially when it doesn't look completely disgusting out like it, like it probably will in like a few weeks. Yeah, I'll give it let the snow melt and we get to really see what the city looks like. Yeah, just the dirt snow, <laughs> just really gray brown <laughs> slush. But I don't know that that's just been kind of my thing lately. Um, I don't know what about you, McLean. I know you like uh, Saint Motel. You like uh, um, I'm not entire. I can't remember exactly what else you told me that one day. Uh, I got I've gotten a little synth wave. See, I'm not a big like uh, artist guy. Mm-hmm. Like you know, a lot of people pledge to name the band Kanye West. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't. Well, it's one I, I mean, dude, I've never seen so many people go to battle for like a person. Oh, that my they don't God. know and like listen to music. It's that just, does not know who they exist at all. It, who has like so many fucking billions of dollars. So wild to me. Yeah. And I'm not like sitting here saying it's right or wrong because I mean, a lot of people do it in a lot of ways. I mean, some people did it with Bernie Madoff. Um, you know, so it's like, how, you know, it's, it, I don't, I haven't, I've never planted my flag and said you've got to listen like the older like zeppelin or springsteen oh, stuff yeah. like that I would, but that's like it you know i'm not attached to music in the same way i am movies usually like music music i think is something that i can just comfortably enjoy and not really think about the nuances and like what makes a song good or bad it's just something that if i listen to it and i like it i will just listen to it and enjoy it right like i'm not thinking about like how good the vocals are if they're no like if they're not noticeably bad or i'm not thinking about like the rhythm or like the instrumentation usually i'm just enjoying what comes together if it sounds good to me yeah so no that's why i mean and i fall that's what i'm saying i fall in the same boat i find myself watching or listening more to people i haven't heard Mm -hmm. or um you know i get like on spotify spotify helps me out a lot so i mean yeah uh, so I think the one the one guy that popped up on Spotify um, that I had never heard before that I, I listened to quite a bit and actually had a, I, I mean you know liked a lot of the songs Tupper uh, I believe it's Tupperwave Tupperwave uh, yeah you were telling me about him yeah that one episode yes I remember now Abs- I looked him up so he <laughs> comes up in my search history yeah Tupperwave was absolutely like someone that I mean it popped up it was like t- your top five artists I think he was number one. 
Yeah. I was like, man, that's wild. Because like, I go through phases of, but I, a lot of his stuff I liked, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's new or not, Bren, but it's new to me, so I'm going to make it my answer. Yeah, we can't really we, we can't really speak on what's come out this year, but I mean, you know, I, I like listening to kind of some easier stuff like Iron and Wine, The Shins, uh, Modest Mouse, <laughs> although some of their songs kind of go a little hard. Yeah, which a little I enjoy. too much for me. Yeah. Um, I enjoy listening to a lot of synthwave like Mac. I like uh, per- Perturbador or Perturbator, however that's pronounced. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Careful where you say that at. I know, right? Well, if you look at the covers of those albums, you might be more inclined to say Perturbator than <laughs> the other one. Yeah. Uh, they're very uh, explicit. Um, there's, uh, you know, MGMT, M83 um daughters i really like that's more of like kind of a punk rock kind of heavy industrial band Mm -hmm. there i think their album is called you don't get what you want or something like that um or you won't get what you want i can't remember exactly what it's called but it's the one with the cover of like the white kind of skull painted face essentially um but yeah no just a bunch of different stuff usually whatever i'm in the mood for like if I'm in the mood for something relaxing, I'll usually put Iron and Wine, or The Shins, or one of those two. Um, if I'm in, if I'm want to like pump myself up, it'll usually be Have a Nice Life or Daughters or, you know, something like that. Nice. So, there you have it, Brent. I hope that kind of satisfies your question, even though we really didn't <laughs> answer it in the way that you probably expected. We're not big music dudes. So I don't think it's a question. So however it gets answered, it gets answered. It gets answered and it got answered. Um, so yeah, we got one more bit of business to conduct before we sign off. I have so many different, there's, you get to make a film pick recommendation, (gasps) which you haven't been able to do in about a month. Well, I haven't, there hasn't been anything. So like maybe we'll talk off air on on some of the stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. I got an idea of what we can see, too, that's in theaters. It's kind of a big one. Coming out? It's been out. It's been out? Yeah. What's it start with? A. A. Yeah. You know, A. A. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with Blavisar, the gay of oh, the bobber. Dude, I don't know if I want to fucking... <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> You've seen the first one? Yeah, I've seen the first one. <laughs> I gotta pair something up that goes with this now. You don't have to pair up anything I mean, that goes oh, with it. Oh, I know. We'll choose. pair up. No, 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 no. We'll no. pair it up a hundred percent. You can We're choose whatever. Let me let me tell you this. You can no. choose whatever movie you want, regardless of whether or not we see Avatar: Way of Water. Why did you tell them that? They had no idea. Well, we don't. I mean, I guess we don't have to see it. I guess, but I mean, I feel like it's important in a way because we'll see it and the sequel to the biggest grossing movie ever. So we're in two made up universes. uh, So we're gonna see that. And have you ever seen Congo, starring Tim Curry? Ooh, kind of a Tim Curry train going. Yeah, I have not heard of that movie. You've never heard of Congo? Mm -mm. Nope. We're gonna watch. We're gonna watch. We'll see. Bavatar, the gay of the bobber, the gay of the bobber. Yep. Oh, I get that. Um, <laughs> and we're gonna watch Congo. Both of these okay. dealing with mystical creatures and far what away year did, land. What year did Congo come out? Just just so I can look it up, and there's no other movies called Congo that I mistake it for. I don't think you will. Well, one, there's only one with Tim Curry well, in it. I so. guess that would help too. But 1995. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, a decade after oh, Clue. Oh, how about that? What? <laughs> you got to tell me. Oh man, this is a movie that in uh, college when I was at Grand Valley freshman year. I used to go to this party house, and uh, and Sam might have been there. And Sam didn't partake in any of this stuff. Like I would, like you know, we yeah, it was a place where I drank, and you know, sometimes uh, some of the some of the ganja got passed around. And I remember one time we were like, everyone had ta- everyone had seen this movie up that's at some point in their lives. Mm-hmm. So we got one of our buddies to order it from Amazon. We bought it. 
we all had a great time before it right yeah throw it on and uh yeah it was it was it was magical it was a very fun experience but all right haven't seen it on imdb it's a 5.2 stars so oh okay (laughs) (laughs) i can't wait it's been a minute since we've had some good uh, score diversity. I, I just saw what I rated it, so it'll be really interesting. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to watch this thing either because it's been it's been 13 years since I seen it. The last time I saw it, I was under the influence. So like, okay, wondering where I where I'm at now. Excellent. It'll be fun. I can't wait. Yeah, so Congo it, with Tim Curry, 1995. Yes, that's going to be exciting. Can't can't make a mistake. Excellent. Like uh, Michael Crichton wrote the book. It's based on a book, dude. You're gonna love it. You're uh, you're like into books and shit, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> reading more like stupid, dude. <laughs> um, okay. So, all right. Thank you, Mac, for that recommendation. Um, if you don't want to be spoiled for Congo with Tim Curry, 1995, and oh, uh, dude, this is a and uh, Avatar. The, the way of water i always want to say the way of the water like i feel like that's the what the subtitle the should be yeah but it's just the way of water the way of water how yeah. water impacts us how wa- how much water weighs the oh. weight of water oh 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 yeah completely spelled it the wrong way the way the weight of sam worthington yeah like how much has he put on anyway uh He's thank not you even in this thing in avatar too well, I mean, you know I think he I'm, is you know what i'm saying Oh, well, uh, mm, uh, oh, he's the he's because he's blue, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not him. It's Are the you avatar. making a? Because I did he put on a lot of weight? I'm I just read... making. I'm just making a funny. Oh, a little little cheeky, Got it. Got little it. tongue yeah, in yeah, my yeah, cheek. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yep. Well, your tongue in my cheek. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for listening. If you don't want to be spoiled for either of those films, uh, be sure to check them out before episode 36. Uh, these episodes come out every other Sunday. You can find us on www.neoncrewpodcast.com. We're also on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. My voice is dying. Holy shit. Um, <clears throat> oh, wow. Yeah. Excuse me there. Wait a minute. This isn't even a killer episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, we only had one question. We still hit our mark. Booyah. Uh, yeah, you can find us on various social medias and and working out on merch still. Getting the website going. Get I, close. I promise you, I cannot say for certain if it's going to be up before Christmas. But, oh, by the way, when you're listening to this, it will be Christmas. Because this hey. episode will come out on Christmas. Merry Christmas. So, Merry Christmas. Man, what a treat. I know. Here's your present, you ungrateful son of a bitch. Yeah. So, enjoy it. Don't cry because you got a new episode of the podcast or else Santa's going to beat the shit out of you. Oh, dude. Oh, he's that's gonna what sc- I should have recommended. He's going to 4D scratch and sniff you. Man, that's another um, hidden hidden, hidden gifts, hidden treasure. Boy, that's a Swedish Santa film, and it is a different take on Christmas. Well, save it in the bank, because we're watching Congo. <laughs> I've already sold it. <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> You already gave it away. You can't change it now. Damn it. I know. Uh, Mac, any parting words for hey, our listeners? Did you do the where find us at? We got all yeah. that in there. Yeah, I got the website and YouTube, Spotify, nice. Apple Podcasts. All right. Hey, hey, from everyone out there, from from my land of yours, and from our Santa to yours, WWTHD. Bye, everyone.